I think we'll uh, getting close to, to getting this issue resolved. And uh, if when okay. Good evening, everyone. It is 6.11 p.m. We are at the City of Cape Canaveral City Hall Council Chambers for our March 19th, 2024 regular City Council meeting. Uh, with that, I call this meeting to order. Thank you for all being here. And Council Member Davis, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Kellum? Here. Mayor Morrison? Here. Councilmember Willis? Here. All are here. Thank you, Council. And now we're at the uh, approval of the agenda as written or with amendments, Council. If you had a chance to take a look at our agenda tonight, we have roughly nine numbered items. Um, if we'd like to change the order or any other changes, please let me know. I'm Council gonna, Member Jackson. Yes, I have some um, changes that will be to the workshop minutes. Okay, well on the consent agenda, so but are you okay with taking that up first? Uh, that's That's the first one. I think you'll pull that from the consent. Is yes, that what you want to do? That's okay. That's what I'm wanting to do. That's a good heads up. We'll get into that. Um, my my only request is item number nine, eight and nine are both informational. Um, I do have a comment uh, on number eight when we get down to the end, but I would like to discuss uh, item number nine. Uh, today and move this up on the agenda. This is a priority. We only get together so often. And so uh, taking it from the informational item number nine, and I propose we get to it. Uh, after a, well, just right after the consent agenda, our, I know we have an item for action on there, but I'd like to make sure we have enough time. Um, either way, if it falls as a discussion, we don't have a lengthy agenda tonight, I'd be fine with that too. But uh, council, uh, any thoughts on that? No, I agree. No objection. No objection. Okay. Any other changes? Okay, seeing that, uh, I guess I move to add number nine as a discussion item. Let's just say right after the golf cart. Is that is that okay? I know that was your item. I think we'll get to it here. And looking for a second. I'll second. Okay. I uh, made the motion, uh, seconded by Councilmember Willis, to move item number nine as a discussion item. Uh, any further discussion? City Clerk? Four. Councilmember Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Councilmember Willis? Four. Motion passes 5-0. And uh, that's it. I, I think we're, we're clear on, on the agenda. Now we can move on to the presentation interviews portion of the meeting. The first one that we have here today is a presentation of proclamation as Water Conservation Month this month of April. I'll go ahead and uh, read this proclamation, go down front there. And do we have someone here today? Mr. Cannon's here, sir. Mr. Cannon, thank you very much. Tell you what, I'll uh, go down there, read this proclamation, then if we can take a photo, and please love to hear some remarks if you choose. Thank you. Thank 
Good evening. This is an official proclamation of the city of Cape Canaveral, Florida, whereas the city of Cape Canaveral's surrounding natural environment, the ecosystem and unique beauty it affords are the foundation of our community. And whereas the planet's environment is currently facing numerous perils from human related activities that must be addressed, including a loss of biodiversity, extreme weather, sea level rise, and freshwater depletion, and whereas water is a basic and essential need of every living creature, and whereas the state of Florida, the St. John's River Water Management District, the City of Cocoa Water Utilities, and the City of Cape Canaveral are working together to increase awareness about the importance of water conservation and stewardship, and whereas the City of Cape Canaveral and the state of Florida has designated April Typically a dry month when water demands are most acute, Florida's Water Conservation Month to educate citizens about how they can help save Florida's precious water resources. And whereas the city of Cape Canaveral has always encouraged and supported water conservation through various educational programs and special events. And whereas every business, industry, school, and resident can make a difference when it comes to conserving water, and whereas every business, industry, school, and citizen can help by saving water and thus promote a healthy economy and community, and whereas as outdoor irrigation compri uh, comprises a large portion of water use, it is important to encourage citizens and businesses to focus on improving outdoor irrigation efficiency, and whereas the City of Cape Canaveral will continue to support and expand initiatives that enhance water-based sustainability and resiliency in order to improve the safety, security, and well-being of the residents both now and in the future. Now, therefore, I, Wes Morrison, Mayor of the City of Cape Canaveral, Florida, Brevard County, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Water Conservation Month in the city of Cape Canaveral to help protect our precious resources by practicing water saving measures and becoming more aware of the need to save water. Sign and seal this 19th day of March, 2024. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you uh, for bringing awareness and attention to this very important issue. I will say, uh, I'm really glad that you're the one that had to read this. This is like half your meeting right here, so I'll try to keep my comments brief. I'll we'll have to work on shortening these every year, too. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a special emphasis this year on, on leak detection. Uh, as you can imagine, if you have an irrigation system uh, at your house or your business, if there's any kind of an underground leak that has not been detected, it's wasting tremendous amounts of fresh water, and that's really what the focus is on, is fresh water. Um, so this is a good time of year. It hasn't been very rainy uh, to go out and check those systems just to make sure that they're operating correctly and there are no leaks out there. But uh, as I said, I'll keep this brief. So Mr. Mayor, council members, City of Cape Canaveral, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So the next on uh, the agenda is an interview applicant for the appointment of the Culture and Leisure Services Board. No stranger, I see former council member uh, Angela Raymond here tonight for the interview. City attorney will ask you a few questions, I believe. Well, you get on the receiving end of the usual question. All the information in your application is true and correct. That's right. Ex explain to the city council why you're back. <laughs> you want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> I'm interested. I'm interested in the city of Cape Canaveral, and I want to see the city of Cape Canaveral keep moving forward. I think we had a good run the last five or six years, and I think we just need to keep going in that direction. I think without a clear vision 
for the future of our city. Without that, nothing will get done. I went to see Cabrini this afternoon, and I'm reminded of this, that you must have a vision, a vision, uh, and a can-do spirit, a can-do spirit. especially when it comes to culture and worship services. Because this is the way that we raise the quality of our lives. And I think with our community center and our case center, and hopefully our civic center, this is going to serve our residents and give the residents what they really want for each other. Thank you. Thank you, so uh, council? City Attorney, no further questions from you, I believe. Uh, council, if we can go down the line or move around. This is an uh, interview opportunity if you choose. Any questions? I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you for making the effort to be on this board and to continue with the City of Cape Canaveral. Thank you. My input will continue as long as I live. I'll resist the urge, but please I, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate your willingness to continue to serve. Um, I do have one question. How do you propose to keep from having six hour meetings? <laughs> I think that uh, the person who takes care of the chair for culture and nature services runs a pretty tight meeting and usually they get finished. One, one hour, one hour and a half. Isn't that true, Molly? I think that's very important. Time management. I don't want to sit through five or six hour meetings okay. in the morning. Okay. Council Member Willis, any further questions? I, I could, I could. Well, we can come back. No, <laughs> no particular no. order. No, 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 no. I, I, I'll, I'll, feel free. I'll, feel free no, no, no. No, no. Um, um, I appreciate your willingness. I'll let it go at that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for all your service to the city over the years. And then I had a question. If you could not have your top two spots, what value would you bring to the lower three? Oh, that's an interesting question. Are you talking about the priority list for the new board? Yes. Hmm. Well, I think I have a, a good view, and I think that, you know, I know the city pretty well. Um, hmm, that is interesting. Hmm. I think that I could probably you know, give as much as I could possibly contribute to any of the boards. And I think, you know, as far as planning and zoning, I know all about ordinances. And naturally, we took a lot of advice from planning and zoning. The other boards, huh? I think I know something about all of them. And Doug served as chair for the Board of Adjustment part-time, so I did go to those meetings also. And I understand exactly the fine tuning that they have to do for different kinds of ordinances. In fact, I remember the big one had to do with um, Cumberland Farms. So I think I understand how that works. This is not the moment to go there. I think I understand about business. And as I see our city grow, I think that we have to grow in the right way. And when we develop, we have to develop in the right way. And I think sometimes we have to be careful about too much development because I think we have to also worry about A1A since A1A hasn't really received the funding. I think we have to worry about that because we don't want to create so much volume that we can't even get the public that it wanted. I think I get there faster by bike. So I, I could contribute to, to, to any of them. And I think I will be fine on any of the boards. But this is the one that had an absentee, you know, uh, uh, you know, space. 
So I think Tulsa and Lee was a good pick for me. Thank you. Hope I answered it okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Pro Tim Keller. Yes. Thank you, Angela, for your dedication. It's apparent that you love our city. Um, and you have you will bring a lot of expertise and and um, to the board. I just had one question. I watched the meeting, um, and and you had made a comment, and I wasn't sure where you were coming from, because I believe that the boards are a representation of this the citizens in the city, and they bring a lot of um, knowledge and expertise to the council with their recommendations. You had said in the, uh, in that that um, that the council and the board need to stay in their lane, and I wasn't understanding what you meant by that. That that came from a question that was asked of me. Uh huh. And I think, yeah, I think you know what I meant by that. No, I, I, I think that I think that the council has a job to do. I think that the boards have a job to do. I think staff has a job to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes some people think that they can control things that really shouldn't be controlled by them. That's what I meant by that each, each group needs to stay in their lane. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I meant. I just, um, because I think it's important for the board to be able to bring the representation to the board from the residents and ha and have ideas. I didn't know if that meant, no. you know, you no. you have tunnel vision. You know? no. No. Okay. Well, I uh, thank you again for your dedication to our city and your love for our city, and you'll be an asset to that board. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions, Council? There, I don't have it. Questions? I have lots of questions, but for this, you know, out of all the board members that I, uh, we've had the pleasure of appointing, <coughs> you're the only one that, you know, you're unique. You're the only one I've served with, you know, until one of these circle back, uh, you know, after terms or myself. And I, I would, I look forward to seeing our boards become full. And I think it's important. I do have some comments, but that's not for the sake of this interview. I'll be taking those up when we take the agenda item up. But thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you for uh, staying plugged in and continuing to be a great cheerleader for Cape Canaveral. You always have been. Um, and yes, thank you. No other questions from me. So with that, I think we're finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so the interview is complete there. Uh, we are now moving on to next item here, which is public participation. I've got two cards here. Um, excuse me, I have three cards. First one here is John Benton. <clears throat> I took the time. Thank you, Mr. Benton. Okay, I'm here because I want to know why I couldn't defend myself in a code reduction hearing. This has been going on 10 years this June. When you accuse somebody of living in a warehouse and you find them guilty and you laugh at them and the board members who are Christians are laughing at it, that's disgusting. And then, Mr. Mayor, you trespassed me because Judge Crawford asked me to bring a sign with Mayor Randall's and Attorney Kim Kopp's name on that sign here and hold it here because you guys caused problems and you trespassed me. Said I was undesirable. This is what the board did. You're the only board member left. These other board members, I don't know why they aren't looking at you saying, why can't John defend himself in that meeting? But we know because it's Kevin Mann, the witness that you guys called, the deacon in the Presbyterian Church coming in, lying, telling you that he didn't have anybody living in this warehouse. We had a whole bunch. I got a carpenter who only unit I own. He's a cop in the unit next to me paying me rent. I'm not going to live in that unit. 
You gotta let someone defend themselves. So you thought so you wanted to take it out on me because everybody thought I was homeless living in there. I've owned my condo on that warehouse since '88. Why am I gonna live in a warehouse next to a cop? Why couldn't I defend myself? Why can't I come back for an appeal process? The only person that can answer that now is you and the lawyer over there, or his lawyer, and the city manager down there. You fired Mr. Green. Mr. Ramos lost his first election because he trespassed me for that sign. And Judge Crawford probably is the one that fixed this to where you can't make anonymous complaints to the board anymore, to the city, for people living next for code enforcement issues. You owe me. A, you owe it to me. You want to go another ten years? I will. You had a twenty-year-old case on Stewart on Search Drive. You aren't doing anything because of Kevin Mann, who's a deacon in the church. His son was living in a warehouse on a sex offender site, and you find me guilty of living in it? You, why didn't you do that? Where was the cops at? You know he's in there. It's on the list. You know who's on there. There's only three or four, and he was one of them. Do you really want someone like that? His, he's, he's covering up for his son, living in the warehouse, so he doesn't show the real address. Do you really want to do that for your people? Your citizens, you've covered up. You put religion in front of it. Religion is not going. It's tearing this country up. Look what it's doing to Israel. And this lawyer is a Jew, and the lawyer that hey, has hey, a problem with listen, the Jewish. Listen, listen, John. It was racism. Stop. You're not going to come up and be boisterous and and slander. That's not slander. I'm okay. Making, I'm making allegations. I believe this is racism. Thank you. You can. Thank you. And with that, we'll go to the next public comment card. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, Ms. Peg Schaller. Um, thank you very much again for the opportunity to be able to speak. Um, I don't know that I say it enough, but I really do appreciate all the hard work that you guys did in Elder City. Um, everybody was on the path to an improvement. Um, I just want to second um, what Angela said. And yes, it, it takes a vision. And I'm happy to see the work that the city is doing and the vision. And I just uh, witnessed the <coughs> CRA uh, development um, agenda and you know was at the meeting and the, a few things came to mind and I'll be brief the community redevelopment plan is for the elimination of slum and the prevention of blight the reduction of crime job creation was the one of the ways that we could be awarded um, a benefit there and um, you could also use those funds for storm water so it's great to have a vision like this but the vision has to be backed up with day-to-day -day code enforcement that is ensuring those of us that have spent the time, the money, and to be a part of this redevelopment plan are being supported and that the area around us is also being held accountable for the same standards that we were. I understand that in the agenda packet, item page 131 to 137 had some information on it concerning the special meeting request and the information that we had for that. I, I have that, I take, a, uh, I take exception to three specific things on that. It's just three, and I've got plenty more, but let's just go with three. Number one, on the very first page, I think it's 131, it says records prior to February 11, 2022 are not available, but that's incorrect. There's a notice of violation dating back 2017 it is NOV 2017-127, and you can see 19 violations on that. There's, so there is plenty of record available going back. Number two, also on the same page, it's under a listing of 12-13-2022, where it's an entire paragraph that really does nothing. There's no forty code enforcement issue there. It's just a staff report that's really kind of a... Uh, an attack on my personal character. The fact that nothing in that paragraph is true is really second to the fact that it's even in there in the beginning and it, it cast shade and it just shows a bias 
straight from the beginning. And then the third thing that I take uh, exception to is that it says on 12-14-2023, staff was made aware that a portion of the parking area, and this is a parking area at 7802 North Atlantic, was previously paved and the new area uh, that was, an area that was never paved. I guess this is continuing. It, do you so just um, need a, some? Two minutes probably. Uh, council, are we okay? Two minutes, I like to work through the council. I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, okay, so again, really brief. It just says that on that date, 12, 14, 2023, they were made aware that the, there was an area that was paved over an area that was previously dirt. Well, that is not correct. I sent the email and I showed where that area was previously dirt. And it is not, it does, it does me no benefit whatsoever to throw shade or to cast any disparaging on any of the neighboring businesses. In fact, it works against me. The, the better off they do, the better off I do. But the, the items listed in the community redevelopment are the exact same items that I emailed. I said, hey, there's an area where this water's running straight into the storm area. Hey, there's blight across the street where there's homeless people trying to prevent crime. Hey, there's a hole in the ceiling. Hey, the upstairs has been condemned and we have these vagrants living in it. I gave an entire email on how I thought we could improve the city. And again, those areas that are really, what I'm focusing on is life safety, environmental safety, economic development. Those were not the, not one of those received a notice of violation. But somebody came into my restaurant to tell me the number of restrooms I had and the number of chairs to determine that I deserved a notice of violation. Or that I put down gravel and that was an immediate notice of violation. The areas to the left of me, to the right of me, and across from me all received either courtesy calls or courtesy letters and I immediately received notices of violation without those. And mine were not life safety, environmental, or economic blight. And I'm still asking, please don't send us down this path of this new re-envisioning project and ask people to come and invest their money in our city. If we cannot take the basic steps of ensuring the codes that are already in the books are being held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Third and final card I believe I have is Ms. Tina Freeman. Hey, Tina, come on down. Just start, Professor? Okay. Um, my name is Tina Rose Freeman, and I'm here tonight because um, I am very um, interested in wanting to serve on um, the board um, the, of City of Cape Canaveral, and I submitted my application, and I haven't heard anything yet other than it's been received. So um, I just want to let the council know that um, I'm available. I just finished serving um, eight years on our HOA board. I've also been involved in two um, nonprofit organizations on their boards. And so um, I've owned here since 1996. And um, I just want to make you aware that um, I'm available and I want to serve. And I've submitted my application. But no one's called me yet. <laughs> so I just want to let you know. Thank you. Thank you. And that was for the board, I'm sorry, the uh, Culture Leisure Services Board or the community the panel? Cultural, the Culture and Leisure Services Board was my number one pick. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then um, my other one was the, um, the oh, uh, community awareness. Or that community board. appearance. Appearance, board, I mean, so yes. Community appearance, that was my number two. Well, I'm sure staff have got the application at some point, I think you said last week. Yes. And yeah. uh, our city manager, if you need to follow up, I'm sure can point you in the right direction. I'll probably Molly or okay. someone, but thank they, you. They need to just point it out, Molly, this evening to me. So thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so with that, that concludes public participation. Fortunately, we don't have the, the live stream operating right now, and so we're going to uh, keep going down the agenda here.
Anyone else who intended to speak that was not heard, please raise your hand before we close. Seeing none, we'll close. We're now on to the consent agenda. Tonight we have a total of five consent agenda items. Uh, I believe Council Member Jackson expressed a desire to pull item number one earlier. Is that still the case? Yes, that's the case. Okay. Um, Council, if there's any other items we'd like to pull, uh, please do so. I would like to uh, add items two, three, and five, please. So items one, two, three, five, all but four. Um, all but four have been pulled. I'm seeing nothing else. <coughs> the one we can approve, if, if, unless somebody wants to pull item four. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda item four. Got a motion by Council Member Willis, second by Council Member Davis to approve item number four from the consent agenda. Any further discussion? City Clerk. Council Member Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Willis? Four. Those of you listening, that was to approve the statewide mutual aid agreement with the State of Florida Division of Emergency Management providing for reciprocal emergency aid between the City of Cape Canaveral and the state and other local government entities in the event there is a need that cannot be met by our existing resources and authorized mayor to do the same. Had a chance to talk with our city, attorney, our city manager about this and uh, I'm excited about that. Thank you so much for working on it. And so with that from the top, number one, uh, Council Member Jackson, you pulled this one. The floor is yours. These are the uh, approved uh, February 15th, 2024 workshop and February 20th, 2024 regular meeting minutes. Council Member Jackson. Yes, I just had a couple of little um, really tweaks on some of these minutes okay. for this meeting. Um, there's a section that says concerns over low charging data so far. And actually that was concerns over low usage due to it being peak season and yes, charging sir. station utilization being low when the numbers should be higher. Council Member Davis. I was just gonna say, can you specify where you're? Oh yes, that is, thank you. So item, which is it, the February 15th minute workshop? The workshop, yes, February 15th. Okay, so um, it's a few lines under, it's in the first paragraph. Under items for consideration, does the monitor ahead of us, is, is that yeah. the, the correct? Yes, it's in the middle of that, you'll see a sentence um, EV charging parks with EV chargers presenting arguments not to have chargers. It's right above that. Let me see where it is. Um, concerns over low data charging so far, increasing the hours operation. It's the concerns over low data charging so far that's really meant to be the fact that we were looking at the fact that it was low usage for the number of charges okay. for the fact that it was peak season. Mayor, if I can help, I think um, what we're suggesting is we strike the words charging data so far. Yes. And insert the words usage based on it being peak season and charging numbers being low when higher numbers were expected. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we're in the second sentence. The first sentence is a longer one, um, really starting at the word discussion. Is that right? And within that sentence, we're striking which section or words in that? The, the, the words charging data so far will be stricken. Concerns of the low charging data so far. 
and instead read concerns over low usage based on it being peak season and charging numbers being lower when higher numbers were expected. That's how I understand it, if I'm correct. That's correct. So okay. it's just a simple thing there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and then there's another section just a little bit lower. Let's see. Um, presenting arguments not to have chargers while at the same time discussing a marketing strat strategy. We were really um, taking a look at any market decline indicators and being aware if we need to make adjustments. While discussing the marketing. So do you want to remove a word that you do not feel, is it the argument line you'd like to strike? Or? Right, because it's a little confusing. Presenting arguments not to have chargers, that wasn't really the intention. It was presenting market decline indicators and discussing a marketing strategy in regards to reporting and making adjustments if necessary. So instead of presenting arguments not to have chargers, mm -hmm. it was presenting market decline indicators while discussing a marketing strategy if we saw changes in reporting. So you're fine with saying while at the same time discussing a marketing strategy. Yes. So you want to remove and replace, remove the sentence presenting arguments not to have chargers with presenting it, uh, it was market decline indicators or right. It was analyzation of market decline indicators from reports and making adjustments and so then the just and then marketing if needed. Okay. Um, Best way to say that is that concern <laughs> over market decline right there mm -hmm. is that. So I think we can. can it's different than that, or was that? Does th no, that was different. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because this wasn't an argument to have the chargers removed. This was an argument to look at reports and make adjustments based on usage. Okay, well, let's just take that one by itself. Presenting arguments uh, not to have chargers, you do not feel re accurately reflects the intentions of I'd that. say okay. strike that. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, let's pause on that one here and go city manager or city clerk. Is there any, I know sometimes in the past, if, you know, if it's not accurate, it, it, would, would this be okay on your side? Um, when, when I had, um, Mrs. Jackson brought this to my attention um, when she met with me, and um, what I explained to her is, if we make corrections in the minutes, we have to be very careful that we're not adding words that were not said, but it's okay to clarify, to be more precise about the words that were said. So, um, and what Mrs. Jackson is saying is, these are clarifying the words that she said, but they didn't get captured properly. So what she's proposing is a clarification for council to approve. Thank you. Okay, and the motion needs to specifically, as stated, uh, the words you wanna remove are presenting arguments not to have chargers. That, that anything else just for this little tidbit? If, if I have it, sir, it's leaving the word presenting. Okay. But striking arguments not to have chargers, striking those five okay. words, instead inserting market decline indicators. Okay. And then leaving while at the same time discussing a market strategy, profitability and technology. Mm hmm We'll catch up in time. And then I think right there, and adjustments to reporting as necessary. 
Does that capture it? Opposition. Yes, thank you. And then leave the rest of it. Okay. That was uh, it. Council Member Jackson, that captures it. Thank you, Dear City Manager. As stated, would you like to make a motion to to amend the minutes, assuming City Clerk is... I can just read the entire, that whole thing if it helps, <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> Let's say as stated. Want to make sure it's captured. Yeah, I'd like clerk. to make a motion to change it as stated. That was correct. Okay. Mr. Morley. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Jackson and a second by Mayor Pro Tim Kellum to amend the minutes as, as stated by our city manager. Any more discussion or council on this? Are we okay with that? Well, I think the, the minutes should also reflect that uh, it was basically a discussion because there were two sides to this. Um, and I question whether those statements represent both sides. Um, I mean, I, I can agree with the changes, but uh, it uh, turns into a statement being adjusted here. Because we're not, we're not capturing the fact that we also uh, discussed counter market uh, data. Counter? Counter to, counter to this. Uh, okay. To the intent of some of this initial statement here. It's silent on that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I explain? Please. So when it comes to workshop minutes, I normally, in, in, in regular minutes too, <coughs> Robert's rules I, well, I try to follow Robert's rules, but I also try to follow council's desire to have some discussion captured. So that's why I always start with discussion, ensued, and included. It's not discussion included the entire conversation. So this one was a little tough because there was a lot of information to share. And I spent a lot of time deciding what to put in there and what not and um, you know content that you know was more detailed than I'm used to in a workshop <laughs> so you know if I didn't capture it properly I apologize um, but that's what discussion ensued and included means it, it doesn't mean the entire conversation and if it skews one way or the other or the other I apologize on this set of minutes and you did a great job because it was a very detailed <laughs> um, Thank you. And with what you said, Council Member Willis, maybe that second piece we leave because there was discussion about removal, there was discussion about making changes if, if we saw things that indicated that we should. Um, maybe just change the one concerns over low charging data so far because really that was what we discussed just a moment ago, where it's concerns over the actual usage of them based on it being peak season. So maybe that one session is really the only thing that needs to be changed. Have, after having heard me, uh, our city clerk, and council member Willis. So we've got a motion in a second to uh, amend it as stated. Uh, are you, so what would the change be? We would need to amend the motion. Are you saying just remove the sentence or the section of the sentence arguments not to have? Just, just remove the concerns over the low, low charging data so far. Okay. That we discussed just a moment ago. Leave the other one alone because we did discuss what options there would be if we needed to make changes while we were discussing the market during the meeting. So, you know, that one could probably stay, the one about removing them. Mayor, I can recap if it helps. If yes, and I think as stated, thank you would be to amend. Yeah, if council has consensus to amend the motion, the motion would now be only make the one change, which is 
concerns over low and then striking charging data so far <coughs> and insert usage. So concerns over low usage based on it being peak season and charging numbers being low when higher numbers were expected and that's the only change. Yes. Okay, so we've got a mo we need a motion to amend the main motion and as stated and then a second. I will make a motion to amend the as stated. I'll second. Got a motion to amend the, the main motion as stated by Council Member Jackson, a second by Mayor Pro Tem Callum. Any further discussion on this amendment? City Clerk? Council Member Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Callum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Willis? Four. The motion to amend the main motion passes 5-0. Now back to the main motion as amended. Any further discussion on that? City Clerk? Council Member Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Willis? Four. Okay, motion passes 5-0. Item number one to amend those minutes. And the other meeting, or on item number one, was there another, any, anything else, Council Member Jackson? No. Item one, okay. And so I think we're, we're done with that one. Anything else on the city side that we can provide? Thank you. Move on to the next. Do we need to approve the minutes for the council meeting? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for past the February 20th council meeting. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Willis, a second by Mayor Pro Tem. Any further discussion? This is for the, the regular meeting minutes, the second part. Seeing none, City Clerk. Council Member Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Willis? Four. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to item number two. This is a resolution appointing a member to the Cultural and Leisure Services Board of the City of Cape Canaveral. Uh, this is in re uh, regards to council, uh, former council member Raymond, who is now applying to that board. The, I have some questions on this one. This is why I pulled it. Um, how long is that, uh, who would be the best to ask questions on? The applications? The, the, the board vacancy. The board, um, well, Molly administers the board, but the city clerk's office handles the applications and vacancies. We just gather them, and then when they come in, as soon as we, as soon as we get an application, depending on what's been chosen, what their um, preferences are, we send them out to those directors, all of them, and then they they take it from there. So um, I can't remember off the top of my head, you know, when we we received her application. Um, it, I think the application was dated December 13th. Okay. The only reason I know that, that's my birthday. But uh, it's still, <laughs> okay. but yes, I think. Okay. Okay. So, um, however we received it, I don't know if Angela hand-delivered or emailed off the top of my head, I can't remember. But um, then it would have gone out to the different directors. As far as the vacancy, though, it's mm -hmm. it's a seven-person board. Mm -hmm. I think that it's been operating as a six-member board, advisory um, board. For, for a short while, Molly, right? For how long? That would be the question. Is how long has it been operating under a six? Molly, do you have that information? How long has this vacancy, I guess, been... been there? So a year ago, we had a seven-member roughly. I would, I would have to verify. It's been several months. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is the, this application, so was there, there, is, there are, um, if I remember, alternates in the old 
but I had a chance to watch the meeting as well. And we we're talking about procedures. Is this a full seven person board or is it five with two alternates? It's a full seven person board based on the uniform code that council passed. You don't have alternates anymore. Wonderful, thank you for confirming that. I think there's old bylaws and stuff. It sounds like those have been amended. So now with the uniform code, it's seven. The do we remember who the, the last board member was? Did their term come to an end or did they resign? Um, I believe that was, now I'd have to check my records because it's been a while, but I believe that was Marlene Woodside and she resigned before she passed away. Thank you. So when that, um, one thing uh, just on this, uh, as we're considering this is, uh, just the procedures there, this is a comment on, I hope we can uh, get a, a process there that would allow and standardize this a little bit better to understand, because I did not know the vacancy was on. I didn't see um, anything being communicated. I think it was up on the marquee, and but sitting there for that long for a year, uh, that board, I think, just preparing for this, should function as a seven-person board. And it, it's it been functioning with six. Um, and so that the procedures on how we fill the vacancies, I've talked to residents who want to be on boards. I tell them, you know, contact City Hall, find out more information. And this particular one, I think we heard tonight, uh, Ms. Freeman is also interested in applying. I'd like to see our boards, you know, where we have options and applicants to serve. Um, and this, <coughs> if it was filling a vacancy, is it a, is there any remaining term left in it? Is it the remaining months of I the? I don't think so. Okay, so the vacancy confused me it sounded like if Miss Woodside um, had resigned, um, that, that that vacancy occurred at that point, initiated filling that vacancy. I guess I, I did not understand if this was to fill the remaining term, or is this a new? This would be a new appointment. The the, the summary says it's filling a vacancy, though. Right. My recommendation to get to it is I would like to postpone this item um, and bring it back at the next meeting. I'm willing to come back early if there's an urgency to get this filled and for a special meeting. But around the, the procedures uh, to do this, we've got, it, it's a, it was a little confusing to me. Um, I'm excited that council member Raymond is willing to step up and serve. Uh, but I know that citizens in this community wanted to be on this board. They did not know that this was open. I wanna help our culture and leisure services promote any time a vacancy occurs or if we can get the boards, I'd love to consider you know, working through this uh, in the community. I went back into the meetings the leisure service meetings and listen to. I don't recall any conversations in those boards talking about the vacancy. I think those board members would go out and communicate. And so it's not anything that, there's just very little in our code that sort of guides this process or in the bylaws that I could find. And I think that we've got an opportunity to, to fill all of our boards, not just this one. Um, and so with that, my hope is that we postpone it and we consider an, the applicant and any others. Um, Can I be of some help here? That would, yes, okay. please, so thank you. So this vacancy has been vacant for quite some time. Last year we were only able to get two meetings off the ground because of the lack of quorum. So when Angela's um, application was received, we immediately got her on the agenda for the first meeting that she was going to make for the interview. Since then, we have another vacancy for a gentleman that was not able to make any of the meetings. The uh, person that has applied for that vacancy, which if Ms. Raymond was appointed tonight, 
that vacancy, that person would be interviewed at the May meeting of the Culture and Leisure Services Board, and depending on their recommendation, that person would appear at this meeting. Since uh, this other applicant has uh, submitted an application this week, um, that person will also be invited to participate in the May meeting. And from those two people that are applicants, that would fill the final vacancy and that board would be filled for so the first time in years. So the vacancy today, Ms. Woodsides, as we recall, is what we're considering tonight. And you're saying there's another vacancy that mm -hmm. will be coming up? Yeah, Mr. Holmes resigned from the board at the Mr. Uh, couple weeks ago. So um, we have an applicant that we received an application for um, shortly before he resigned. And that person is on schedule to be interviewed in May. He would actually be interviewed at next week's meeting, but he had a work obligation. So we had to move him off the agenda and move him over to May. So the city doesn't operate under a deadline or to say, hey, up until this date with the ability to even extend the deadline because it's really once you get an application, we, we don't look for any other applicants and we just go forward with the one who submitted. For this board, historically, in the 10 years as of today that I've mm -hmm. been a part of this board, um, no one's been beating down our door to participate. So when somebody submits an application, we speak with them in advance to let them know what the requirements are, what the responsibility, what the, the, the level of engagement that they're going to be expected to perform is. Mm -hmm. If that checks all their boxes, then we move forward with the interview process. But we don't build up a, a bank of applications, if you will, because we've never had that luxury. Understood, and I think that when we get this filled, uh, Council Member Raven stepped out of office. We shared this dais in the last day in November. A month later, the application is submitted, and this seat's been sitting there for, for a, long. Good, a long time. And we've posted multiple times on social media about volunteers and joining boards, and then Daniel also included our board listed by name on the marquee. So, And the amount of times I get people that talk to me about um, either wanting to volunteer or the fact that we should rely more upon volunteers. Every time I stick an application in their hand, I don't get it back. Well, I think we've, it sounds like potentially three applicants, including Freeman, Ms. Raymond, and the, another applicant that mm -hmm. was submitted. I think Ms. Freeman's was submitted last week, the gentleman. And I think maybe the week prior, it's the first come first serve that sort of gives me a little anxiety. I want to work, it's not for tonight. This how do we do this in a way that has a close period and we can take in applicants. I want to help make that problem exist where we do have, just like you know, we go out to bids and I agree, every single board member that's walked up here, it's the one in line who submitted. We're all thankful for that person. We appoint, we interview, we ask questions, and it's in good faith that we move forward. Um, on this one, this board's really important. I want to see, uh, hopefully, more citizens get involved in boards. I think they're out there, and being able to uh, think of creative ways to get these filled, um, I think, could start with the procedures, because th the truth is, I've served with council member Raymond before talking to the council now and we've agreed and voted on a lot of things together as a, as a council we've done some really good stuff we rallied with a1a the roundabout we can go through the list there's good all the way through the areas where we disagreed respectfully was largely around culture and leisure services and the priority of how those funds were being spent and the projects and I'm in a position today, unique as I said earlier, where I'm in front of an, an, an applicant who I've had the ability to serve with. And when I hear about the other applicants, this is a circumstance <coughs> where I think we have an opportunity. And so my recommendation is that we postpone this until the next council meeting. It's sat for several months and we bring back and look at the the all the applicants now that we've had two or three ignoring the other vacancies i think that when a vacancy 
is when a resignation comes in, like you said, having a period to say, we're trying to fill this vacancy in 60 days. Please get your applications in. If you don't get enough, we can extend and other ways to do it. But under this, it's like we don't know when the vacancy occurs unless you're, you know, at the board meeting or I guess you wouldn't really know that uh, there. And then the, the public, yes, I see things pop up, but specifically culture and leisure service board member, you know, vacancy exists. I didn't see anything on social media that was specific to that. I did see the marquee, I believe, uh, and maybe that was, you know, a part of the image, and that's okay. I get it. I know what you're saying. This is a circumstance where what I heard in the interview at the leisure services are not focused on the priorities and the, the comments about stay in the lane as a, just a philosophy, as a worldview. Um, Ms. Raymond and me, within this area, there is a direct disagreement. And, we've tr and so I have nothing else to say other than I would be reluctant to move forward tonight without considering the other options. So. Well, I would disagree with doing that. We can't punish Ms. Ms. Raymond. She's applied, what, in December? These other res op or applicants have just done this. I agree we should support everybody, but we have an application coming up. And uh, listening to you, I feel that it's more a personal thing that you do not want to put her on this board, which I have to respect your opinion. I think we should go forward with the vote, and then if you vote against her for whatever reason, then you do. But I think she's put in it for since December, and she deserves to be on this board, and then the other two can put in for the application for May. So I disagree that we should postpone it. Thank you, Council. Any other? I have. Well, we've we've gotten a recommendation by that board. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're acting upon that board's recommendation. And if there's another vacancy with two more applicants, then that board is going to send us a recommendation between those two. We're not going to see both of them or all three of them together. We're just going to get that board's recommendation, correct? Yes, sir. So I think uh, we probably should move forward, in my opinion, with uh, Ms. Raymond filling out the that one board seat through October of this year. Council Member Jackson, Mayor Pro Tem, any comments if you choose? I do, I have some comments. Um, I have a couple of concerns about this. The first concern is I was in the city council meeting in the fall when there was a discussion with pickleball and tennis and we all know that Angela's uh, absolutely involved with tennis. So I feel like with the rate that pickleball is increasing that we could end up with a conflict of interest there. But more concerning to me is what I know has happened based on information that I've gotten. And that is that if you are on that board, you directly have an impact on election communications via booths that are given out via Friday Fest. And we've had multiple occasions in the past where certain candidates were not afforded a booth at Friday Fest. So until we get that issue resolved to where we can come up with an, an absolute uh, alternative where no one that is running for an office in this city is rejected for space in Friday Fest, which is election communications, then we should not have any council member, not just Angela, any council member on that board until that can be repaired because that manipulates and changes elections or has the potential to or the perceived potential to. So for minimizing risk to the city and liabilities of lawsuits, I think that needs to be repaired before we consider an, any ex-council member 
or anyone of that nature that has sat on this dais to be on that particular board. Thank you. I just want I, to make sure everyone has a chance to go. Do you, well, Councilmember Davis? I don't understand how being on a board is affecting an election. Um, there are rules and to getting a booth at the time. You have to be put in a request for it to be in on, you have to request on time for a booth. Um, I, I just think that this is a personal thing. I know, and I, I'm gonna speak respectfully, but honestly, I know people on this dais are against the, the Civic Hub. And just because in the past, Ms. Raymond has said that she's for the Civic Hub and different reasons, or for pickleball or for tennis or whatever. I mean, I don't see where that has a conflict. If it is a conflict because you're afraid that because you're against the hub or whatever else, and she might push an agenda through the board to, to push those things for the hub, that's something I, I just think is totally different. And I disagree that, I mean, if you have a, you know, a difference, then you vote no tonight, but I think it's only fair to move forward. I have no idea where, it, I don't understand how it affects elections. So I don't think the board has anything to do with that. Well, if a person is running for office, and they're not allowed a booth at Friday Fest with notice, and they're not allowed that, that is affecting their election communications. Now, I'm not saying, this has nothing to do with the community, the Civic Hub for me. It doesn't. It is for free and fair elections, because it's not just a personal experience of mine. There have been other candidates that were refused a booth on at Friday Fest. Okay, okay order. I, I will just you can't, you can't. Yes, I'll tell you right now. This is nothing but politics and you know it. And that's Your it. Your order. Is, that's point of order, please. Yeah, point of order. Yeah, point of order with you. I Thank for you. For what it's worth, forget yeah. it. I know it was it. a good interview. Forget it. Yep. For okay. what it's worth, Ms. Jackson, uh, after the election, of this past year, we sat down and figured out a solution. And that board, makes me so happy, Molly. But our board had nothing to do with that. I don't, but it, it's a board that controls that is up under that board, is, am I correct? You're they can opine on it, but in terms of like the day-to-day -day operations thing, mm -hmm. that ultimately, like when we make determinations on the rules and stuff like that, if it rises to the level as you're indicating, it goes to the city attorney and city manager. Well, and, and what I'm saying is I'm aware of multiple cases where candidates were refused, and it should be a simple thing, and it's not, for whatever reason that ha that happened, um, if that board is involved with the rec center and Friday Fest at all, that we need to fix those things first before we put a council, an uh, ex-council member on there. That's my opinion. And I get to have that. Unfortunately, it's not made Angela happy. Now, it's not just, you know, the last election I'm talking about. I'm talking about other elections. So for me, if we fix that, and I'm so happy to hear that that's something that's been addressed, um, because if we fix that, then any council member that wants to serve this community is able to do so without fear of having someone's First Amendment rights breached or anything else like that that could be literally put the city in a situation where they have a liability issue from a lawsuit. So that's what I'm looking at. It's not a matter of who wants what, although we'd want to make sure pickleball and tennis are both represented. I can't play either one of those. So, you know, but in my opinion, and, and I was unaware that's been repaired to this point, but in my opinion, we need to make sure every candidate that puts a, an application in and is qualified to run has the ability to be at Friday Fest to speak to the citizens in the city and give the citizens the availability to know every candidate they have out there. I don't agree. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Molly? Thank you, Molly. I just want to say that I am embarrassed for this dais. You have a great person that's been committed to this city and has given and donated so much time. And she put in for this months ago. 
there was an opening. Now there's going to be another opening next month. And I, um, I, I just think it's shameful that you guys are using, I, I would say, personal reasons. Um, she had nothing to do with your election. So um, I, I'm just in total disagreement with you. I'll give the uh, any other questions for Molly. Tina, if you don't mind at the end, I'll make sure to circle back and go. I don't have any questions for Molly. Thank you, Molly. Um, I think that, Councilor, are we okay with hearing? Would you like to speak, Ms. Freeman? Is that what you're, please come forward. And once you get up there. Thank you. Well, I did want to clarify something. Um, as far as the public publicizing um, the board um, availabilities, the only time that I saw on the marquee, it said board advisory positions available apply. It didn't say any one board in particular. And I only saw it on the marquee. I look at the city government pages. I look at the Facebook pages and I never saw it. I'm sorry, but I never saw it publicized except on that marquee one time and it never specified a specific board. Secondly, the way I found out about um, a board availability was I was at the board appreciation dinner and inquired and I was told that there was an availability. That's when I found out about it and I submitted my application right away upon hearing that news because I've been looking for that um, opportunity. Um, and lastly, I was at a, a council meeting here when there was discussion about um, doing a mailing to citizens and uh, doing a survey to citizens. And at that time, Angela Raymond called myself and other residents here, she called us stupid and, and, and uninformed and called, you know, was so condescending and nasty to us citizens sitting here in the audience at that meeting. And I mean, it, w it was devastating to hear because we want to be involved and we're not stupid and we stay informed and we know what the issues are. And um, to be called out like that at that meeting was, it was very, very hurtful. And um, I, so that's why, you know, I want to be on a board, I'm a team player, and I want to be on a board and serve the residents here and not be um, spoken to in, in such a way. And so that's, that's why I'm really wanting to serve and serve the citizens. And I know that there's other residents who want to do the same, but have not been provided the opportunity. And it's not been well publicized. Thank I you very much, Tina. Yeah. Yes, and I think our procedures, uh, uh, any applicants would go before the culture and leisure service. There's a, pr a process. I think if we can understand that process as a council, it's an opportunity to eliminate some of these confusions because these vacancies pop up and the board who voted 5-0 in favor of recommending, recommending uh, former council member Raymond to serve on that board, to my knowledge and understanding, did not have any prior discussions that just appeared on the agenda and it's like the applicants in front of you and of course that's how we've done it in this circumstance i have uh it, it is based on the positions taken behind this dais which is as professional as it can get and i think the alignment with the citizens is is skewed and that's okay C council member the former council member myself we get along, we're all neighbors, but when it comes to making these decisions, uh, if we wanna rush the vote today, I'm happy to vote no. I was trying to postpone it to learn more and to consider more. From my understanding, count, uh, the former council member decided, I think said, um, you can have it or something to that effect. I don't know if she's still willing to pursue it. If not, uh, it, it is, I, I don't think it's, wise for us to proceed with this. And the agenda summary, I think, said it was filling a vacancy. This is for a full three-year term or two-year term position. And so I think if it, we- It said serve until a October 1st, 2024. To, to fill, okay, so less than a year. I, and is that the not the case though? I think it's gonna go to 2027. No, it, it, it says, unexpired term that will end October 1st, 2024. 
But I think our city manager clarified that. It, that that's what I clarified, that it is an ex it's a vacancy. Fill a vacancy, voted to recommend her, to have the remainder of an existing unexpired term that will end October 1st, 2024. And the resolution also says, shall be appointed to serve until October 1st, 2024. So it's an unexpired term. I mean, in March 2022, we're talking about two years this has been vacant. This yeah. term is vacant due to a farm. So yeah. for two years, this sat vacant. I didn't hear a whole lot. And I know how to find this. You can go on the website and you can see on the board roster, our city clerk and whoever, they do a good job of, you can always find it. That's not my, where my issue is. It, uh, my issue is, is it sat vacant overlapping with council members term right when she's out that that's filled and I've talked and you know with folks as we said and so this opportunity presents itself I hope we can consider other applicants and I think we we postpone and if we're going to vote I, I certainly would oppose Mr. Mayor I think we need to just we just need to strike it yeah, but at this point I mean at this point no action is necessary okay. I mean the message I received from the applicant is that she withdrew she did so I mean, that's how, that's the impression that I got, Mayor, and, yeah. and I don't think any action needs to be taken on this item, and you can just move on to another item. Council, we're okay with that? Thank you. Okay, and thank you all for your patience with that. I am moving on <clears throat> to the next agenda item. We've been through one and two of the consent. Uh, item number three, I see uh, here is resolution 2024-02, amending the defined contribution retirement plan for the general employees of the city of Cape Canaveral <coughs> beginning in fiscal year 24-25, so 2024-2025 budget, providing the repeal of prior and consistent resolution. Uh, and so... I think city manager, I see Melinda's here with us tonight. If you would like to kick us off on this item. Sure, um, Melinda, we hate to see you go and it breaks our hearts that she's leaving. But uh, this is a good time to introduce Natalie Harmon. Natalie, if you'll wave your hand, she's gonna be Melinda's replacement. Um, and she'll be here for the rest of her career, I'm sure. <laughs> um, Melinda brought this up. Um, because she had spoken with Jeremy Button. He's our League of Cities representative that administers the retirement plan. And the city of Cape Canaveral employees do not have a, a pension. Um, we're not big enough to qualify for the Florida retirement system, so we have what's called a defined contribution. The city currently puts in 7% into a 401 account for the employees. There's a vesting period as well. Um, currently, it's um, five years to get fully vested. At four years, you're 75, three years, 50, two years, 25, and so on. So that 7% of the salary goes there. But also the employees have the option to voluntarily contribute 3% of their money into an account that they can do, it's a 457 account. And the city um, 20 years ago did both of these, maybe it's a little more than 20 years, set up the, the 401 and the 457. <coughs> if the city, if the employees give 3% into that 457 of their own money, the city as an incentive will match up to 3% and put that in additionally in the 401. Employees can put more than 3% in, but the city only matches up to 3%. So Jeremy brought this up, um, and Melinda was discussing, and he was, uh, his email is in here, where he talks about the standard best practices of the current market for public sector employees. Now keep in mind, we can't compare ourselves with private sector. It's not a fair comparison for them or for us. We have to compete in the market that we're in to attract and retain employees. So that's what this is about, is attracting and retaining employees. And the recommendation is that we look at that and consider some uh, adjustments. So he gave um, a handful of uh, examples of other cities that um, similar to us in size and a range of practices. And we're on the low end of all of that. So the recommendation is that we move, <coughs> move that up. Um, so there's a, a proposal in here that Melinda can talk about. Um, we can do that proposal. We can do something less. We can do nothing if we want to do nothing. Also, Jeremy pointed out that the, the vesting period that is, is kind of an antiquated thing for cities because um, 
it, it doesn't serve anything but a disincentive because it, and most public employers have dropped that in Florida where this five-year vesting thing, and, and it's not a significant thing for us to lose it entirely, just drop it, because the, the money that is forfeited by employees who leave before they're vested goes into a forfeiture account, goes right back into the city's general fund. That forfeiture account only had received how much, Melinda? It was really minimal. A couple um, thousand, three thousand dollars, I think. Oh. Yeah, it's on attachment A. The average over the last five years was seven thousand, but um, 2022 had a forfeiture of twenty thousand, which really skewed the data because that year after the pandemic, people were an inflation. People were looking for that extra dollar. We lost. Carenza, Stephanie Johnson, Candace Blake, Aaron Letty, Jim Moore, we lost a lot of people who were not fully vested. So our average forfeiture account per year is probably about 4,000. So it's, it's really low except for the great reshuffle and the things that happened after the, after the COVID pandemic. So in other words, the point is that's low hanging fruit in Jeremy's opinion that we can easily just remove that vesting period or maybe just put it after probation, six month probation. So really those are the two things that we're talking about doing is changing the contribution to the 401 and the match on 57 and uh, reducing or eliminating the vesting period, Mayor. Thank you very much, Council. Any questions for, this is a resolution proposed. Uh, any questions for staff or amongst ourselves? Yes. Excuse me. Um, in, in reading, uh, Mr. Button's comments. Um, he wasn't able to clarify on the vesting period for some of these more robust plans. And um, the worst thing for me from past business experience is to overstep and then have to claw back later. Um, in my business practice, I hesitated to hire just for a project, which I know this, we're, it's not apples to apples here, but the worst feeling I had was when that project was over and I had to let somebody go. Uh, what I wouldn't want to do is to maybe overstep what our position might be next year and then have to do one of three things. We have to raise taxes, cut services, or lay <coughs> off employees. Um, I don't want to do any of that. But I, I do think we need to do better on this than what we currently are. And I would like to propose a uh, go to from 7% to 10%, not the 11, and then remain at the 3% match, which saves us about $92,000 over what the proposed is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum, I think he wants you to repeat, Council Member Willis. Your proposed? I didn't get it all. All right, there, the, this proposal is to go to an 11%. Mm -hmm. I think we should go to 10% and remain at the 3% match and if you look at the spreadsheet that they gave, they, their proposal would have been a $181,000, $181,300, I don't have my glasses on, $310.44 difference. Whereas that difference, if we maintain the 3% match, would be based upon the salary that we have here, uh, would be at a 92000 $940.71 difference. Yeah, and Mayor Pro Tem, I, I didn't finish saying, I should have added, the proposal was go, to go from seven to 11 and from three to five. Okay. Um, what um, Council Member Willis is saying is, don't do that, instead just go from seven to 10 and leave the three where it, where it is. That, that at least gives employees the understanding that we're trying and if we could do better later, we, but I think we should uh, move in a cautious manner and uh, see where we are in another year or so. 
Thank you. And so, Council Member Willis, I think you're referencing, or at least attachment number seven, which we have up here yes. on the board. The left side is kind of as today. Yes. This is how we're, we're operating with the 7% and 3%. And then the propose has 11 and 5. So 7 and 3 is 10. 11 and 5 is 16. So we were looking to do a 6% jump. One way to, and we're saying it would just be a 5% increase seven to ten yeah eleven and or no ten and three percent oh ten and three it's a three percent thank you three percent mm -hmm. instead of six percent thank you for clarifying council member jackson or mayor pro tem council member davis any other and council member willis i don't know if you've had anything else no, I'm, um, the vesting period, I mean, right as is proposed, it would be the six month probationary period. Um, you know, we could go to a one year vesting period, but I don't really think that gets us anything. Um, I think uh, removing a required vesting period beyond their probationary period um, gets them into the game quicker and uh, the employee has a vested interest in staying. How long would that go back? Six months. And, and this would only apply to the initial six months. If somebody takes a new position within the city, they are under a six month probation, but this wouldn't, this wouldn't peel that back. Right. I agree uh, with uh, Council Member Willis. Um, I think that, um, you know, looking where we are and making a, you know, I would rather give increment uh, advances than give it and then have to take it back. And, you know, it would be nice to stay, <clears throat> to keep our taxes low for the residents and um, also take care of our employees. Um, I think maybe, um, seven to nine percent and keep the same three percent. I mean, I don't know what the numbers, how that would change the numbers a lot, but um, you know, I'd go up slowly then make that big jump. Nine, nine percent would be a uh, um, roughly a $62,000 increase and going to the 10 percent would be a $92,000 increase. Before we get too far down on the road with, and I know a form of motion hasn't been made, we're just discussing it. I just want to make sure, uh, make sure we got to ask any questions. I do have one if we don't mind if I jump in here, because I think I can pick up where you left off. But the, the, uh, Attachment number six, averages of best plans. Um, can you explain what this is? It's the best plans average out of 11% for 401A and 5% for the 457. I see, are, is this the comparative analysis under entity? Mm -hmm. are, are these actual entities Melinda. that are just? Uh, yes. Mayor um, Morrison, if you look at Jeremy Button's email, that mm -hmm. should be um, do, 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 do. attachment five. <laughs> yes, thank you. Attachment five. His mm -hmm. reply back to me, dated February fourteenth, is, you know, um, it's not always clear cut, but what the best because some of these have longer vesting schedule too. Here's a few examples. So he gave us the top ones that I included on that separate attachment where I was able to compute the averages. And so this is the data where I, you know, was able to derive my numbers from. Melinda, what do you mean by the top ones? The best plans that Florida League of City has currently for public entities. Administer. 
And, you know, this hasn't been updated in over 20 years. And the job market right now is really scary. And the city staff, you know, we have a great team. But I'd hate to lose a staff member because they could make an extra buck someplace or they don't feel their investment plan is, you know, competitive. So I just want to do my due diligence and advocate on behalf of the city and for the employees and do the right thing before I leave. Thank you. You're welcome. Could I have add a little perspective to this? Mayor, after you're done talking, if yeah, I could add a little perspective. Absolutely. Uh, you, I just want to make sure we, so, so there's no specific, it says in that email that you referenced, it says city, water management, fire district, wastewater. These are other cities, but we don't know who, public, they, who he's referencing, or is he saying just an average city of? They are public entities, Mayor. And he said, well, I can request to find out their names for you, but these are public entities just like the city that Florida League of City handles. Yeah, so to me, you I mean to me, I wanna make a good decision and we can get into the numbers and certainly we wanna be able to retain and attract, but I, I would like to learn a little bit more about who we're comparing ourselves to. And John, please, your comments as far as long-term liabilities, you know, for the city and moving forward, and that, that's a concern. And just general with the transition as Melinda is going on to a new chapter and we welcome Natalie in to help the parachute in and out. Um, I think the whole uh, focus as we're heading into the budget, this is a big financial decision every year we try to figure out what we can do to make our employees' lives better. And if retirement, if it's time to talk about retirement, I'm ready to, to do that. But as far as my due diligence, I'd like to learn a little bit more about what <coughs> the cities near us are doing in these markets. I don't need, I, I assume we can, these are all <coughs> Florida-based data. Okay, Florida League of Cities is the host, so John. I would ask the council, we're talking $92,000. A year? At ten, the ten, yes, and the, the 10%. What I would like council to do is from the financial perspective, look outside the box here on what transpires when we're doing the budget. Last year, council had staff cut to reach, hopefully, you know, the millage that it wanted roughly $600,000 off the budget. Um, the year before, three or $400,000. The point I'm making is this. We have a CIP meeting in a few weeks. And if council is looking at staff and the importance of retaining staff, $92,000 is a drop in the bucket when council reviews those CIPs specifically for the general fund, and they're gonna see what's in those CIPs, and some council members may say, we don't need that now. Why do we need this $90,000 CIP? Why do we need this $110,000 CIP? So the point I'm making is, you're gonna see those things on April 4th, and you are gonna find things that, and I've had talks with a few council members already, concerning what approach they may want to take. But you're going to find that some of those things are not that important. And you weigh that against what we're talking here, $90,000 to retain employees potentially for the next five, 10 years and make us competitive. If you think of it that way, this is a very good thing to do. This is an excellent thing to do. Think of it that way because in, on April 4th, Council, you will find things that you're going to want to cut out of those CIPs that you see. Now, remember, we're specifically talking about the general fund here, okay? So I want you to just look at the whole picture. You can go and compare to other cities and what have you, but try to look at it from that perspective because when Council comes up in, with the budget in July and starts looking on how they want to keep taxes down or whatever, what are they going to ask 
the finance director and his staff to do. John, can you cut $300,000 off the budget to get the tax rate here or 400,000? Well, in the past, we've done it. So now council has an excellent opportunity to support the staff, support the employees, and look hard at the CIPs on April 4th. And mayor, you'll find that $90,000 and you won't even have to think twice about it. And it would have it would have been the best thing you did for your employees. I'm just asking you to think from those different perspectives, as opposed to thinking that wow, ninety-two thousand dollars, you know. So, Thank that's you. my comments. Thank you. I would. Th those were some of the questions I have. I'm not ready to 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 move forward with this. Um, that's my position. I can explain why. I want to. I want to retain employees, and I want to figure out ways to to make that a reality. But it's ninety-two thousand dollars. This is this year, and then that will stay the same, or will that? That's going to more than likely increase every year. If we and, retain and this employees, is, this yeah. isn't a one-time capital expense. This is a liability we're going to service. Yeah, if we retain like employees, we re retain employees. But you got to remember something. Hold on, I oh. just want no. We've got a lot to work through tonight. Okay, I'm, okay. I just think it, it was important time? to add in perspective, but yeah. I won't make any more I won't make any more comments, but you gotta remember that the employees throughout the year, there's a ebb and flow of whether people come and go, not that there'll be every year. I'm just saying as the finance director, this ninety two thousand dollars is a drop in the bucket compared to decisions you're gonna make on the CIPs that you see and you will pull some of those CIPs. That's all I'm saying. That's, I'm just going on record saying that. Thank you, Mayor, for letting Thank me speak. Thank you, and I look forward to being able to, you know, compare different expenses. Employees is really important. Um, Mayor? And thank, yes. Um, may I speak? Please. Um, so your question is, when does this 90,000 take effect? It'll be for the upcoming fiscal year 24-25. And your <coughs> next question was, will this increase every year? Not necessarily. I mean, we just lost a um, director of capital projects and he was making this much salary. So what the city was matching and then contributing, it's gonna be hot, it's gonna fluctuate depending on when you bring somebody else in lower. So it's, you know, who knows? We, it might be a $90,000 increase this fiscal year, but next fiscal year, you might lose a lot of top people and then have low people. And it might only be a $70,000 difference, but God I'll forbid. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I mean that number's going to go like this, you know, it's just going to be set. But it's going to be based on roughly 50, 60 employees today, not all vested, but I guess how many was this number based off of the 92 or the proposed? If you go to attachment seven, which was produced by Florida League of Cities, mm -hmm. on the left-hand side for fiscal year 23 contribution amounts, this was the numbers they provided us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my recommendation, like we said earlier, was 11% automatic contribution and 5% match. That would that would have increased it to 181,000. So, but council, but I'm sorry. I just want to jump in and not to, the, I'm, at, I'm at, a, we're at attachment seven. Okay. This is based on how many employees? Our current full-time staff, sir. So how many? we how currently many? have 58 full-time employees. So 58 full-time employees today are making, or we're, the city is contributing around 85,000 on those same 53 employees. On the 3% match, sir. Yeah. The, go to the, go to existing the left. conditions today. Well, there's we already have that in our budget that's coming out. But you only mentioned left. the 3% match. You didn't mention the 7%, which is 216,000 on the left there. Thank you. Both of those roughly over 300, that 302,000 up at the top is today. Based on the 58, Yes, sir. Employees. Yes, sir. And you kept that 58 as you're rolling in with this increase, you, or did you increase in employees? Is that based on 58 too? Correct, sir. Same. Okay, just making sure. Please go ahead. So my what I what I proposed was the 11 percent and 5 percent, and if you see on the top right, that difference would be 181 thousand increase in the budget. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between my projected 
and the current. Council member Willis came back and he says that he would propose 10%, which basically would make the difference 90,000. So that's the number 90,000 that we're all talking about. 90,000 plus the 3%. No, 90,000 total. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the 10% with the 3%, it's going to be 90,000 increase per year. And the, the proposal, the difference up in the top right where it says 100, the proposed was 181,000 difference, roughly 484,000 a year going out opposed to the 302,000. Correct. But today, that's being proposed to be cut in half, essentially, so that 180,000 difference goes down to 90,000? Correct, sir. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking roughly, yeah. But that's every year we, we would contribute, if assuming they, they stayed. Plus or minus, yeah. It's a big decision for me, and I know I just want to see how we compare to, to the to the cities, and I I'm not ready to do this this right now. Um, it's hard to pass these things just before the budget. It really is because um, so I'm not saying no. I like the idea of, of being competitive, um, and I'm thankful we're not tied into pensions. That's bankrupting some cities and causing major financial solvency issues. And so we are more closer to the private sector, right, where we do a standard uh, match. And, and these two funds here, I think people who want to, you know, invest long term and commit to the city are looking at retirement plans. Um, so I'm ready to, to take it up. But with the transition, I would like to talk. And, and learn and hear Natalie's perspective when maybe not tonight, but whenever is appropriate as well. Um, and, and study Mayor, this a little closer. So I'll, I'm finished. And Mayor, you know, me being your prior finance deputy too, from a budget perspective, I like to prepare and having this before the budget instead of, oh, we're already in a new bus budget or fiscal year, you know, that money's not there. Do we take it out of contingency? Where do we grab it? I think preparing strategically, because I know we have our strategic retreat with CIP and all these projects and capital improvements, but, you know, in my book, strategically in HR, it's the personnel. And, you know, over 20 years, this hasn't been addressed, so. But I appreciate all that you guys do and, you know, taking care of the staff and thank you. Thank you. Is there, I, is there an urgency about it, it having to happen tonight? I mean, if it also comes to the strategic planning meeting and it's part of our plan, does, do we have to make this decision right now? I mean, because I, I feel the same as the mayor. I would like some more time to look over it. I would like to know what cities nearby us do, what cities our size do. Um, you know, same population, kind of the same budget, some comparison. Yeah, you, know, you don't have to make the decision tonight, Mayor Pro Tem. You know, we can come back, circle around, do other comparisons, you know, because I think all of us want what's best for the city and best for the staff. And we definitely want what's best for our employees. We want to keep them, but we also have to think of the big numbers. Yes, <laughs> and I mean, ideally it is budget season, so it's nice to prepare. Mm -hmm. Your timing is good <laughs> to, to, as long as, yeah, tonight wasn't the decision. And are there any other comments, anything? I, I just want to be sure that when we go into the CIP discussions that we keep this mm -hmm. as close to the fore as possible. Absolutely. Uh, because if we let it slide into the background, I don't want to see July come around in August and we're trying to cut. So I, I want to be sure that we have this Absolutely. in I that agree. budget or, or something as close to this as possible. Um, and like the uh, Mr. DeLeo said, I'm sure we can find other things to cut, 
but uh, it is incumbent upon this council to do the cutting. We can't farm it off to somebody else to do because they're doing our bidding for us and they're bringing us their best options and it's going to be us that has to make those tough decisions and not, not have it on other people to do. Last year's budget, we gave the employees a raise and we figured out what other things to cut to make sure they got their raise. So this, I feel, is the same. This is important for our employees, but I really don't want to make a decision right now, tonight. I would like to get closer to the budget and um, get some more information. Mayor Pro Tem, that big raise that we had was actually two years ago after the 2022 inflation. The only thing that we did for our employees this past, this current fiscal year was a 2% cost of living increase. God, that was two years ago already. I know, and I got more gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was a, I thought it was 3%. There's a 3% 3 merit. Up to a 3% merit on their annual evaluation and a 2% cost of living. Um, before we close, Mayor, just one more comment. Um, the larger cities have pension plans. We can't even, there's no point in even bringing that data here. It's, it, you find these types of defined contributions in the smaller cities. Mm -hmm. And keeping in mind that council wants to see some more local data on this, there's not a lot of it. We can get what we can get, but I think when we think about an employer's, an employee's market, they're not only looking in Brevard County. So I think we need to cast that net a little wider and get more, more data than just what Brevard County has. Agreed, I'd like to have some in the greater region, you know, some st statewide, and comparing uh, some cities, uh, so thank you. And if it's okay, then um, we'll, Natalie, bring this back for the strategic, it's not, it's not a strategic retreat, I don't know why we're calling it that, <laughs> oh, it's sorry. a CIP <laughs> workshop. <laughs> yeah, and this is really an ongoing overhead fund, a change to the overhead out of the general fund. For, right, and this isn't, about. This, this, this thing is not, has any, nothing to do with CIPs in terms of our capital <laughs> projects, but when you put it in perspective, like the, Mayor Pro Tem was saying, you know, and then, you know, you could take a look at it uh, depending on what you may cut or whatever and see if it fits into the budget. But I think, uh, and I applaud Melinda for working on this <laughs> just before she <laughs> left us because it's an awesome, uh, awesome item that we needed to do. You know, we haven't done it in 20 years and now we got an excellent HR coming up behind us, Natalie, and she'll be able to get some good data, I'm sure. Thank you all. Is the official, official action then to table this or? I, and also, Mayor Morrison, I agree that we need to, this is perfect timing because we're gonna be in the budget or into the budget here soon. Um, also, I think it's important since it hasn't been looked at in 20 years, but I'm an analytical person. So I wanna know who these examples are. I wanna see that type of information. Also like uh, Councilman Willis's suggestion because it's the worst to go in too high and then strip things out as far as an employee. We wanna make sure that we're uh, giving staff what they can work with, but that we're being smart about how we do that and make sure that we you know, give them the support that they need. 20 years is a long time to, to have that not be updated. Agreed. If, and Melinda, I wish you the absolute best and hope that your your journey is peaceful, prosperous, whatever you wish. So thank you for all you've done to, thank this, you, to help Mayor our Morrison. city. I appreciate that. Thank you, yes, thank you. I miss you. So, so um, Mayor, no action has to happen because we don't have a date certain to table it to. We could just take no action on it with the understanding the consensus is we'll revisit this item at the CIP workshop. Thank you, and thank you for putting this together. Thank you, city manager. Great. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John, thank you, Natalie, everyone who was involved with that. I, I'm looking forward to taking the next step. Let's, we are at eight o'clock on the dot. I propose we take a, a brief recess uh, in two hours now, I think, and we will pick up at item number, where are we? Five. We, Five, thank you. Uh, you know what, are we?
Are we holding anyone up for the tiger dam? Um, we have our health who, who would, we don't, it's not a problem. Okay, we can come back to we that. We can come back. Good. Okay, let's do this. Eight o'clock. Let's um, let's do eight fifteen. And if we come back sooner, eight ten, we can come back at eight ten. And I got it. I need to circle with you, Todd. I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you.
All right, we're at uh, 8.15. We'll get started here. A few 30 seconds, I say, if council were ready. Okay. So. All right, call the meeting back to order. It's 8.15 p.m. We are on item number five. We're at a regular city council meeting here uh, under the consent agenda. Item five is to approve the purchase of Tiger Dam Flood Barrier System for the City of Cape Canaveral Community Center, C5. That's the multi-gen, so as we've referred to in the old past, and uh, in the amount of $47,283 and authorize the city manager to execute the same. City manager, maybe a, just a, I, I pulled this because my questions were largely around, it stated that it was uh, cost prohibitive and we received the cost on the uh, flood barrier that was already deployed. Um, the But in the, on the, page uh, do we know the cost of what it would take to outfit with the the barriers and uh, I guess the question is is it possible or yeah thank you mayor thank you uh, and, and Zach thank you for being here at the lectern um, and the mayor and I did speak about this during the break and I, the question essentially is is there another method besides the dam method that could be used on that store, the large expanse of storefront glass that is cost effective? I'll get you. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, from our research, we couldn't really find anything that we thought was conceivable to achieve the same level of flood protection as what we have here. That also didn't require some type of structural modification to the front of the building, which is what we don't want to do. Uh, this is a completely uh, passive system that is non-invasive to the structure. Uh, there are other systems, but I do not believe that they are up to the caliber that these are. Uh, and in terms of your ROI, that is a small price to pay for possibly saving millions of dollars worth of infrastructure inside the facility. Um, so we felt comfortable going with this proposal uh, also, just due to their versatility, the front of the building is very difficult to protect with standard flood protection measures, uh, such as the ones that we already have, like at the water treatment plant with the metal flood barriers. Uh, unfortunately, the design of the facade of the C5 doesn't really lend to that. Um, and sandbagging would just be really impractical in a storm situation to the level of uh, footage you would have to do to sandbag them. So. That's why we <coughs> at that cost. Do can we go to the the first image attachment one? Um, this is a photograph of the water reclamation facility flood barriers. Those go flush right up against the door. The the normal operations. That's how it is today. And if I understand, correct. W when you, the procedures of a storm's coming, we 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 install or attach that metal strip that's three feet, six inches. Correct. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that, that's about three feet flat. Three feet, six inches would be the height of the tiger dam. So that's three feet, 36 inches high of blood or uh, flood uh, barrier. And the back door, the north door of the C5, that one has already been ordered, it's like this. Yes, the, they will be identical to this. Those are standard doors that had infrastructure in place that were made this type of installation possible. And so standard doors, it works, but we did not, are we saying it's impossible or just, I guess, was there ever a quote on the metal flood barriers for the front and the storefront style doors of any sort? Yes. Do we know the cost? Yes, I believe that one was about 36,000. 36, um, we did look at doors that were similar to this. For the, e for the eastern emergency exit that goes out the stairwell and for the western glass door that 
is under the stairwell uh, uh, in the southwest corner of the building. And then the storefront uh, style facade in the front, we did look at ones that were in the form of where you would install physically into the brick and concrete, uh, mm -hmm. the bolting system that had these uh, small metal, um, I guess trays would be the best way to, to say it, where metal slats would feed in and create like a plank system and would span the storefront. We didn't want to go with that because it would create damage to the infrastructure that we have and it would be a little bit more, um, it would take a little bit more time to install for sure. And it wasn't as customizable in the sense uh, because with the Tiger Dam, you can easily wrap around corners in 90 degree angles or weird obstructions. Um, with the one that we looked, it was possible, but it was just pretty inflexible, literally and figuratively. So possible 36,000 roughly in costs plus the changes and modifications that need to be happened to that style door. It, which gives us three feet of protection and these flood barriers for, I guess, more money. Yeah. The other way gives other us way six more inches. Correct. The other and way so you could look at it too is, you know, with these systems, they're great. They do their job very well. But mm -hmm. They're immobile. So once they're affixed to a particular door, that's your door. With the Tiger Dam system, if for whatever reason we wanted to, we could transfer it to another facility or street or lift station and make a really quick. Uh, flood protection system with the barriers because if with this purchase order we would have 240 feet worth of tiger dam so say the c5 was safe for whatever reason but because the tiger dam is deployable from a box you could take it to another facility or some piece of, piece of infrastructure and deploy it there so that's another cool alternative for why the tiger dam we thought was better well, yeah, I think it's 250, 240 feet of three stacked. It's yeah. actually 750 feet One. of if you did linear, right? True. Because, and so that was where one high is, what, what was the, 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 the depth that one does? Should be about 24 inches. Yeah. So, so one is two that. feet. Then you put one right beside it, doesn't provide any extra. It's literally double your money to just create the foundation. And then the third one adds the height. Not proportional though. No. If it's three feet, you get. There's some compression in there. The compression, so there's some losses and inefficiencies. And so for all that money, you know, I, I wanted to see this other cost. So to, to change, to get six inches higher to me it was a it was a lot more money i i have not the tiger brand but i have these for my house the blow up inflatable the ones that ace hardware sells oh yeah and i i fill them with water same thing and uh provides the protection i like the idea of the city having the ability to redirect water just period on streets flooding if it's entering i know that it's best practices they can set these up and make the water redirect. And so the ability to use them in other areas is great. Uh, but I think it's, and it's not even as much about the damage as it is for me, uh, it's just having a place that's reliable because we have insurance and FEMA and all the federal, the funds, the damage gets fixed, we don't wanna do it. But having, I think you described it as a, you know, a place that could be utilized um, in, in the area. Uh, right, basically picking up as quickly as possible after the storm with the facility, given that it remains structurally intact and relatively dry, as opposed to being gutted from some type of surge situation. Yeah, and so I'm trying to figure out, uh, to me, 47, I mean, it's a lot more money. And the last thing is I went to the site today and had a chance to walk and look. And the C5 is built up off the ground. There's steps that go up to some of these doors, all of them. And so I haven't seen the topography of this area. I understand the flood risks with category two and three storm surge uh, in here is high. 
but it is built in a way, you know, I don't know if it was factored that that's built up. I would be okay with adding, you know, a, a layer or two, but I really like the, the simplicity of the, the, the storm doors and how quick they are to deploy and maybe getting some of these for, for other options. But 47000 is a lot of money. And the way I look at this is, you know, we invested in this C5 and the total price tag for it every year, we're adding more because, you know, we're trying to make it. And it's an, an investment within the community that this adds another 40, 50,000 to it. Um, I, for 37,000, I guess we could have the metal doors, but there's issues. Those are my thoughts. That's why I paused. That's why I wanted to pull it. Uh, again, going into the budget, we approved, this was approved, I think you, uh, at 40,000 we had, and we've already spent some of the it funds. Was, it was approved for 55. 55, we, thank we, you. We, we do have the money. And the 48. That's what's left. Thousand is left, and the amount is forty-seven. Forty-seven. Okay, so it is a hundred ninety-seven. I mean, two hundred dollars a foot. I mean, if I take two hundred forty feet that we're going to have in coverage, and we divide it, yeah, that's a lot of money. Um, $47,283 divided by 240, $197 a foot. Now, linear feet, if we, but we're not going to use them that way. We're going to be able to protect 240 linear feet. But I guess technically, when you add it all up, 47,283 divided by the 750 feet of not seconding, it's $63 a foot. And so, I mean, that's to me, that's a, <laughs> I'm not sure, I mean, I'm that's sitting, a lot of money. I was sitting here wondering, and I'm new. I was sitting here wondering, and I'm new, I'm the new council member. Do we negotiate on these things? I'm going to tell you that because I know that a lot of government um, agencies at the federal level, they just don't negotiate. You know, 500 for a hammer, we just get the hammer, right? I mean, is there, <laughs> Zach, tell me, is there room for negotiation with these guys? Could you go back and say, you know what? They won't give me 47, but they'll give me 39. Do they do that with us in Probably sitting? Not. That, that's shorten, what I thought. We could shorten the length of the system. Uh, to literally only include the, the south facade. The reason it extends around the building to the east and west facades is to cover up any additional windows. So, for example, there's a window that is far off into, like, the grass. Mm -hmm. A traditional system with the flood barriers, the metal flood barriers, I can't protect that with that. Gotcha. So you would be leaving parts of the building exposed. And also there's external drainage piping that leads down from the roof that water could penetrate into. That's on the side of the building, just past the, the east stairwell door. Flood barrier, like a metal one like that, or if it was there, I uh, wouldn't be able to protect against that. And so then I had another question about the construction of it, just because the weather in Florida is so interesting as far as what it does to things. So in comparison with the, and I assume those doors that we saw were steel, stainless steel it looks like. Are they? Yes. Okay. And the material of those dams, which one lasts longer? So the dams, the Tiger dams have a, a shelf life of 17 to 20 years. Okay. Yeah. They will be, hopefully, mostly in storage. Okay. But they're warrantied for five. Yes. That's really what we can count on, right. which is good. I mean, five yeah. years, but after that, my, uh, one of mine had a hole in it. Uh, and I know these are more industrial, but yeah, yeah maintenance. They, they put these through some pretty dramatic tests. I think the thing that really sealed it for me was seeing it being deployed uh, up in northeast, or excuse me, yeah, northeast Florida after Hurricane Nicole to protect Daytona. what was left. They literally put these on the beach against the ocean itself, and they survived. 
we took him down for turtle season, but um, that was pretty eye opening to see that capability. Do we have? A, do you have a link to like a video of that or whatever? Because that was one of the things that I had a question on Zach. There was a, there was a link in there. Okay, I missed because the ones that I saw were not during the storm, so I must have missed that one. I can send you one. Thank you, because I think that's interesting. I saw that. I think basically what it comes down to is I can't guarantee as much protection with the metal plank system as I probably could with this. So given that the building's south to side is complicated and not everything could be really protected with the metal system, given that some don't have the appropriate concrete siding for pads, like primarily the window. Thank you. Yeah, to me, it, it's elevation. I took photos. I mean, I'm not sure we need the, the, the extra six inches. I, but I know that doesn't answer the, the installation, the ease, but I guess, again, going into the budget, we, this is how it happens from my experience is we've got these items we, we approve them, we, and then we find out new information or new opportunities, and then we're already, already extended into the budget. And I did not know, you know, what this looked like. I guess the, the way that we negotiate is we usually put things, uh, depending on the, the type, is out to bid. And so I don't know if this one met the criteria for a bid or if it was, but. We have to follow the purchasing policy for all of this. This was a bid? Yeah, we, we gave three quotes. Three quotes? Yeah. Actually, we got more than three quotes. We got a lot of quotes. Yes. <clears throat> what have you did? Um, can you, if you just did the southwest corner of the building to the southeast corner of the building? Because there is a step up. Mm -hmm. on both sides of you have you figured out how much that would be just to cover and not go down the sides it would be less than forty seven thousand dollars I think yeah <laughs> but I don't know the exact cost that I guess what, what you're saying is what I alluded to earlier is where you could do feasibly a flood barrier door like what's on the screen on the building's um, western glass door mm -hmm. and then you could make a tiger dam system specific to just the front facade and we could take care of one uh, on the other side on the on the left on the east side of the building with a uh, flood barrier a metal flood barrier and then yeah so basically what we'd be doing is we would be getting rid of the uh, one on the east side the one on the west side and then containing it to the storefront windows so mm -hmm. that way at least the windows would be covered and mm -hmm. protected as well as the, the, the double doors right and I'm not undermining one, one tube. I mean, on that west door, just putting one, adding another six inches, because it's already off the ground, my rough, it's about two, three foot above grade. Uh, Councilmember Willis? Um, yeah, on the, um, the flood barriers, the, the metal flood barriers, did that $36,000 cost include installation? No, we installed them. Okay. So putting in the mounting slats, if you will. That is staff time. Okay. Tiger Dam system, only staff time when the need arises. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question too. It says that you can fill it with a fire hydrant. Where's the fire hydrant? I mean, would... There's no hydrant, but there is a water source in the southwest or yeah, southwest corner. Um, there's a concrete pad right there south of the vegetation, uh, just to the right of the last handicap spot. Oh there's yeah, okay. But I mean, if you once it's filled, you can't move it. No, you're not moving. So it. how would you get it around the building, but fill it from there? Well, we would roll it out fix it together in its interconnecting pieces, and then we would run hosing to reach it. Oh, okay. And do we have the hosing yet, or would that be something? We have hosing. 
And then how would you deinstall it? What would happen with all that water? You empty it. We could put it into the park's existing air filtration system. That was the other thing, is that I, d I understand the storm surge maps, but that's sitting right next to the ball fields with a hundred or million gallons of capacity next to it. It's built off, elevated. I mean, it looks resilient and, and mm -hmm. it's uh, overbuilt to some, but to, and then under underneath the C5, didn't we do some, we didn't do anything there underneath it like we did for City Hall? Oh, the, the storm drainage fault filtration no. or drainage under the old basketball courts? No. Okay. We do have to remember, too, in a storm sewer situation, mm -hmm. those tanks would be useless. So sure. It's fully underwater. Yes. Okay. So these are also pretty specific to, you know, they could obviously deal with an urban flow situation with water rise from rain or coming out through the drains from a backflow. Mm -hmm. But I think their real merit lies in their ability to stop a physical storm surge with water coming in from the ocean, like we saw with Hurricane Ian or Adalia in the last few years, where there were facilities that remained unprotected and they basically, they weren't washed away, but they were severely damaged. So these types of systems like that would hold up really well. <coughs> so a single one gives us two foot here and then we would be getting it's one or three, we would be which is the one configuration. The two, but we got to buy yeah one of the tubes or three. There's no reason to ever buy two. Yeah, you wouldn't want to buy two. And so it's here's the price, or you triple it basically. Right. And that's why it, it jumps to get that extra. I mean, extra height. The it. It's a, it, it's just an area that jumped out that um, storm surge. I get it. Um, I wish that it was a better, a better price out there. Um, I don't know if there was other tiger <coughs> dam competitors like within that specific, like almost identical type mine's quick dam i think is another company but uh probably don't scale up to the size that we want yeah no i don't think our residential is all they do it, from what i understand but that's council any more questions i i was I just have another question yes mayor pro tem um in a hurricane when there's a storm surge like that there's also a lot of wind what protects all those glass doors in the front of the c5s they're impact rated Oh, they protect they? themselves. Oh, that's good. They're impact okay. rated. They're very stiff and do not bend. Yeah. So they're rated. Hurricane. And the building itself was designed to withstand 160 mile an hour. Yeah, I have another question. This place will be a fortress. <laughs> right. And I have another question. Yes. Okay, so in the case of a hurricane that came ashore and we're looking at protecting this particular building um, Zach, what is the, as far as all things in regards to services that we provide for our citizens or anything else, is this the top item you would protect? At this time, yes. Well, Probably we've already done, we've already done the water reclamation facility though. Yeah. Waste, wastewater. Yeah. yeah. So with, if trying to stick within the budget, you could certainly sit down other facilities. Mm -hmm. but we just won't be able to stick within the budget. So okay. um, that facility can fit within the budget, the specific portion we're looking at uh, that we're, we've been allotted from the council. And uh, in terms of physical proximity to the ocean, it is the literal closest to the facility. And but the, which one would be most important in disaster recovery? Sheriff's department's pretty important. Probably the sheriff's yeah. department. I don't think we'd be able to afford it, but that would be my next. My next, uh, <laughs> my next facility, or City Hall. We actually did scope City Hall. It's possible, but it just was over, for this particular system, it would have been over $100,000 to surround the building. And see, but, and, and I'm asking these questions for a reason, because if we're spending money on flood protection, I'll, I'm concerned that we sit it, spend it in the right spot, because you know what, I've been on this island during a hurricane and after. 
I'm one of the ones that doesn't leave. I sit out here and watch things float by, usually. So, you know, I want to ensure that we're not putting something on a building, protecting it, when there's something for continuity of government that's more important. So um, that's and a good, that's she's a good hitting point. the point that, that we are looking like, well, 47 for this, we have other facilities, our first responders, city hall, and so when we're doing the math across the board, it's going to be a lot of money. Yeah, I wouldn't, with this budget, I wouldn't be able to fully protect any other facility, given the perimeter uh, footage. But I would say to that, that's a good point. So that we have long-term plans that have already been enacted to the, for the C5 to turn it into what's called a resilience hub, where it basically becomes the logistics and staging yeah, hub for post-disaster situations for the city. So it would become a critical facility. No one would ever stay there during a storm. We're on an island. We can't have a shelter here. That would be too dangerous. But if the facility is intact, which we're slowly but surely designing it to be ready to go, another recent example is the recent addition of a lightning suppression system on the roof. Um, the thinking is that after this, after a storm goes by, and it's a storm that you know takes a punch, like the community has been hurt, there are people that need help, we would transform this, the facility with local emergency operations partners, the sheriff's office and Santa Fire Rescue, into a point where people could come and have food, water, supplies, and communications distributed. Um, we have an outstanding grant with the state to install a battery energy storage system in the facility that can tie into the existing solar array. So protecting these assets with this type of system is why another reason why we want to choose the C5 to be able to keep building towards that goal of turning it into that outward facing resident facility when something bad happens, whether it's a storm or not, you know, it doesn't right. have to necessarily be a hurricane. And I have one more and then I'll, I'll give it up and let someone else ask. What. So do you feel like that building would take a, a punch from a storm because I saw a building um, during Jean, and there were gusts of 175 back over the bridge going towards the base. So, and those were gusts, but I saw buildings on the front, uh, or ocean front, that were 30 years old that barely took a punch. And then you went down and there were newer buildings that literally were, the fronts of them were completely gone and you could see into their condos and everything else and all their possessions gone. So if we were looking at a storm and looking at a disaster like that, would, is, would that building be more sturdy for a storm of that nature than City Hall, for example? I believe and they would hold up both pretty well, hopefully. Todd, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this building was also built to pretty similar standards. They, they were both built to 160, which is, which is a requirement of the Florida Building Code for the use. Right, and that is great to know. I'm appreciative to know that. I also know that a tree flying at 165 miles an hour makes no difference to an impact window. You know, so that's the thing that concerns me about using the C5 as for continued operations, although it has more space and that kind of thing. Yeah. So just those were just some questions I had, and thank you, Zach. I appreciate your answers. Any other questions for Zach or Steve? Anything else you want to add, Zach? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I just, I guess, I just add again. It was a, it was a budgeted item. We're just fulfilling through on it. If I could, I would love to get these installed uh, or at least ready by the hurricane season. Um, uh, part of what comes with this purchase is also included training for city staff uh, mm -hmm. that operate these, which is really nice. So we would incorporate it into the city's tropical cyclone and preparedness recovery plan, make it a mandatory training session for staff as we do already for those metal flood barriers that we saw, uh, the public works services and the, re and the leisure services and really any city employee that wants to. So um, upon the purchase order, we can have them here within about five to six days. So it's pretty quick turnaround. That way we can be acclimatized so that we know how to do it once the, the season starts. Zach, I have a question. If we if we shorten the instead of going all the way around the sides just to the two corners and protect it, do you think that that would be enough to make sure that it was ready for after a bad storm for people? It would save the building. Do you think that's enough protection? I do. Okay. Those windows will keep me up at night. So if the 
protecting those would be my top priority with this particular, <coughs> with this particular system. Well, I would be in favor of getting a price for the smaller, you know, not going all the way around the side of the building to the front. And I yeah. think it's important that we have this facility for the residents and after, God forbid, a, a bad storm. So Zach, can you add, like if we bought it a certain length, mm -hmm. can it be expanded later? Good question, it can. It it's can? A, it's a modular design. Okay. And that's a big thing, too, because that mm -hmm. means we can buy a little bit smaller and add to that, which would give us the ability to be flexible with it if we needed it for another location and needed to add to it. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. So, yes, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Callum, are you saying uh, could we look at, I mean, <coughs> Zach said, budgeted item. I think we were hoping... To get more and you know when we, we look at the quote it, it I see the training two thousand five hundred dollars um, you know you can whittle a little but the reduction in size you're saying keep it three foot high but just cover less of a yeah the area and just from the, the you know the corner to corner corner to corner yeah and what size of the door when you size it down yes we have enough funding to get as described in the agenda item. Yeah, so I mean, the money is there and we, to use it to full effect, I guess, could be my idea to spend as is, get the biggest bang for a buck. So we could, as you were saying, Councilmember Kelm, say we went ahead and got what it is now. Mm -hmm. And then we only did, we still only protected the corner to corner. We would have extra left over to do whatever we pleased with it if we wanted to go that route too. So mm -hmm. you look at it, you're getting maybe two facilities worth of one fifty. Will you be setting it up uh, if it was purchased next week or at least some of it? Could we set it up for the community? I guess when you go out and do the training, is that when? We could do that. We, could, we would normally have done it within the, the public works yard at first, mm -hmm. just to get a feel for the system. But I did envision one day doing a full-scale demonstration and seeing it both for ourselves to see how it works and for the public. I do think that would be a very enlightening thing to see, yes. to show a real demonstration of, hey, you know, this facility is going to be protected with this specific system. This is how it works. Uh, please don't climb over it, the kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Make sure you let City of Cocoa know so they don't charge us for sewage rate. <laughs> I'll write that down. I have one more question, and that is, um, since we have the tidal valve being installed in early May, um, if that tidal valve sucks everything out of the storm system, and which I'm really excited to get to see the impact of this, yes. do we know if we would be needing this before we get that installed to see how it works, are we certain that we need this for anything other than a huge storm surge? Yes. Um, I don't know, if, Todd, you correct me if I'm wrong, if the C5 is actually on the same Center Street Basin. That might be International Basin. Yeah. That's that, far north. The, the, the Center Street Basin ends in the Presidential Streets probably just south of that, a couple streets. So it's different. The tidal valve did not affect the drainage around. Okay, the that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Another good reason for our water balloons. <laughs> Council Member Willis. Yeah, uh, I know that the, the tidal valve is going to alleviate some of the, flood, the flooding issues on residential streets. But it, if we had an event similar to the flooding on the streets a couple years ago. How quickly could this be deployed on a street? On a street? Probably within an hour. But if we were to have an event like what you're talking about, we would have warning for that. The city gets updates from the National Weather Service via the Brevard County Emergency Operations Center. So our incident command team would say to Public Works Services, hey, there's a really good chance today that we might see a flood situation. 
we're going to stage the dam at this particular street and have a water source ready to go and deploy as needed. So it could be pretty quick. Um, instant? No, unfortunately. But with enough warning, it could be relatively quick. Mm -hmm. And we could coordinate with the sheriff's office to say, you know, we, we know which streets will flood more so than others. So we could stage it and even fill it if we want it and say, hey, listen, <coughs> we're going to do it because we know it's about to happen. We could coordinate with the sheriff's office to get the street, you know, prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Worst comes to worst. They have been used to uh, on streets. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. And I think now, so the matter b uh, before us is to approve the purchase of a Tiger Dam flood barrier system of the city uh, uh, of Cape Canaveral Community Center, C5, in the amount of $47,283. This is basically going to finish out the budget. We heard ideas from Mayor Pro Tem about uh, reducing the coverage area, i.e. the price. Uh, I heard some good points about deployment uh, and, and, you know, comparing that to the cost to, to, to get it set up. Other facilities was another good point that I heard. I would also just like to go the other way, not only limited for this, but what would it cost to protect, I mean, for them, if it's a quote, all the Brevard County or Sheriff's Cape Canaveral Precinct, uh, fire, C5, City Hall, I guess it's Cape Center. I mean, any, because the other, when you, go, you know, the more you buy, sometimes you get a deal or that maybe it opens up another product for us or something. And so that's just my, the last thought of where my head would go is, you know, if that is in our plans to make all of these buildings usable in, in recovery for preparedness, I understand this priority. Um, being a, a resource and it's two stories high that's the other part even if the bottom does flood you have the ability to occupy a second right. story i for love the first story just because that has the most space the physical ground space to host those types of recovery efforts the supply mm -hmm. staging seating cooling center kind of thing so you could even you know roll in do, do the double doors in the back golf cart so if we needed uh, to get anything out of there that's quick, load them up, stay a resident, have golf carts coming through, could fill up, fill up water, keep going like an aid station. A lot of versatility that the building offers us that we don't have at the moment, so nice. And I would like Thank to you. see if they would have any leeway with us on price if we were protecting the, the services that we need to protect it during a disaster because Brevard County Sheriff is very important during a disaster, and so are those uh, first responders and fire and rescue. So if we could get everything covered at a better price and have more of this to deploy, that could really be a good thing for us. They probably during won't do that, thing. I'll just be honest with you. But if you want me to put more money into the next fiscal year budget for more systems, I'd be happy to do that. I want you to ask them. I'll ask. Okay, I'm one that I I'll ask. I love asking people. I, yes, I have this saying, you you ask for the moon, if you get a star, you're happy. <laughs> so I'll ask. <laughs> okay, so do we want to do anything tonight with this? Um, I would say to move forward with this, the money's already budgeted. If we can get a shorter one that will do the same protection and save some money in the budget or the money that's already there to go ahead and do it and then look into getting the other, you know, prices for protecting the other places. But let's start with this. I like the idea of having a demonstration to show the residents that this is going to be protected and this is where you'll be able to come. So, you know, I would like to make a motion that we go ahead with this in the shorter version of it and yeah. uh, go ahead and get the C5 protected. Okay. Second. Got a motion by Mayor Pro Tem. 
to prove as written, essentially. Yeah, just with, I think it'll be less than this if we go with a shorter, am I right, Zach? May I? Yes. Yeah. May I just say, we've already budgeted for it, and the if we have the full thing that you've recommended, we have more protection. So if it's already budgeted, why should we go for the shorter? We should just go for the- But save some money. Yeah, but it, we have the budget, and it will protect the building bit m even more. So I would go by with Zach's recommendation. I trust your recommendation. So I would go forward with this, but I would go as Zach has written it. OK. Because you're not talking very much money, the difference in it, and we've already budgeted. If it's already budgeted, the difference in money goes. Yeah. If we don't spend it, it goes. Yeah, yeah. so that's, we don't want to lose the money either. So I Well, would, I mean, it, if we saved $10,000, wouldn't it, we could use it somewhere else for some stormwater protection somewhere well, else? This is being budgeted, too, from the CRA, so it has to be specific to the CRA. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I don't know what I can do on day because it's about ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I, okay. I would suggest moving forward as I, is. I can guarantee you, getting something good is what we got here. So. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So, okay, so we got a motion on the floor, and I think I'm gonna change my motion to accept as written. Go for the money, and it's budgeted. Let's protect the building. Okay. I'll, I'll second it if you're approving as written. Yeah, okay, I'll got second. A, got a motion by Mayor Pertum Kellum, a second by Council Member Davis uh, to approve it as written. My comment, uh, uh, in the contract, page six and seven, the cancellation of the seller. Uh, the seller may terminate any agreement form has been accepted with immediate effect. Where are you uh, at? Buyer, I'm at page six of seven of the PS Industries contract. Uh, this is attachment. The PS Industries is not the correct company. Oh, what am I in? Am I, did I jump? You want US flood control. Thank you, sir. Uh, Guardson? Nope, Garrison? Garrison. Nope. Nope. It is Garrison? US flood control. US flood control one. Uh, the first two. one. Yeah, that one. Okay, and with the terms and the conditions uh, are right there. Uh, the where does it talk about cancellation? We buy this. How long do we have? Uh, I don't see anything. All sales final, or is there a return policy? Because we get it, we don't like it. Um, I would want to have that ability before moving forward because it, well, part of me is just uh, understanding it and if we have the ability to the other ones talked about cancellations I, so uh, if that can be addressed I think we would want that City Attorney, do you? Can I think do do we want a return policy? The ability, if you know, three day. I mean, th ninety yeah. days. The other one, in the box. The other ones have it, so. I imagine they do. I just have to ask. Okay. Um, I know things are budgeted. I know we say that, but you know, going back to the budget, it's a big budget. I did not support the budget, and but I do support flood prevention. And you know, this is more about response, not prevention and new things pop up throughout the year. And so as we're moving forward, this is one that's it's gonna be unlikely if it's needed. Hopefully it's never needed, truthfully. But if, if it is, it is nice to have. 
you know, I just think about what's the cost to rent and have these deployed ahead of a meeting, you know, for, could we use them and, you know, for other communities and rent them out ourselves and get some of the money back. But 50,000 is a lot of money. So that's it. I think uh, those are my comments. I would want to see a contingent or a, some sort of uh, approved contingent on getting a comparable return policy amended in there if it doesn't exist. So that's it. Any further discussion? I, I would like to see a return policy or the potential of one. I, I think it, I think it's just a, a phone call. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I would approve. I, I would vote for this contingent upon an acceptable return policy. I agree. I just want to make a motion. So, do we need to make a new motion? Well, I think the motion on the table is to approve as written, and then you can amend it to add in uh, a, a return. A contingent on contingent a return policy. policy. Okay. Comparable. So if you, anyone can make that amendment to add that in. I'll make a motion to amend the purchase to be contingent upon a contingent upon a, a comparable return policy. I'll second. Got a motion by Councilmember Willis, second by Councilmember Davis to a to amend the main motion for a comparable uh, return policy. Anything else, city clerk? Council member Davis? Four. Council member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Callum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council member Willis? Four. Okay, the uh, amendment to the main motion passes and then the Motion still on the floor uh, as amended. Uh, we've got a motion in a second. If there's not any further discussion, City Clerk. Councilmember Davis? Four. Councilmember Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Councilmember Willis? Four. Okay, motion passes 5 0. Thank you for your time, Zach, and working through that with us. Um, everything works out. We'll be through this FOPP in a week about when we would do a demonstration for the community and we would publicize it. Um, just probably have to let everybody know the building might drop limits for a few hours, take the pickleball pick game somewhere else. So, But uh, we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are now through uh, items one through five, i.e. the consent agenda, uh, which brings us to item number six. Uh, which is an item for action Six. to approve the time, date, and location for a joint council educational workshop meeting with the PNZ board regarding green stormwater infrastructure and low impact development codes and program incentives. Um, city manager, any comments? Yes, sir. This is the joint education workshop that we discussed last month. Council gave three suggested dates for that workshop. PNZ board uh, members, um, the most that can attend, and Dave, I think it's all agreed March 27th would be the ideal one from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., which is next Wednesday. We just need council to ratify that date. Okay. Uh, next. So the proposed date is Wednesday, March 27th? Yes, sir. 6 o'clock. So we would have the CIP workshop at 1 p.m.? On March 4th. Oh, that's March. On April 4th, I mean. Thank you. Sorry, I think that was an old date we were, when I Lisa was working through it. Okay, so that, that CIP is not happening that day. Um, Council, any issues with, now this is, yeah, next, basically next Wednesday. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, any issues with that date? I think it, I can make that work. 
um, and that'd be the only meeting that day? Yes, sir. What did I think? I thought that we were pairing it up with another meeting. Maybe I'm mixing um, with, an, with another item. Okay. What do you think? So we need, need a motion? 6 p.m.? I was told I could leave and come. So. I was told I could attend. <laughs> okay. Yeah, looking for a, uh, a motion to ratify. Is that what you said, Todd? Um, ratify or approve uh, the date of March 27th for the joint educational meeting. Motion. Make a motion to approve March 27th as a joint meeting with PNZ. I'll second. Okay, I got a motion by Councilmember Willis, second by Councilmember Davis to uh, approve the date. Discussed? Any further discussion? Good? I'm good. Okay, City Clerk. Councilmember Davis? Four. Councilmember Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tim Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Councilmember Willis? Four. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Looking forward to that. We're now item for discussion. Uh, we have the one on here, uh, number seven, lowering golf cart registration to gain compliance, submitted by Mayor Pro Tem Kellum. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, the floor thank you, is yours. First of all, I want to explain lowering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I made a mistake on <laughs> it, says lowing instead of lowering. We didn't it's catch it either. Mistake. Nobody caught it. <laughs> it's it's an actual <laughs> word. Look it up. Is it? It's funny. Oh my goodness. All right. Um, I just, through observation and um, being around the city, I've, I've noticed lately a lot of golf carts on the sidewalk still. And I was, wanted to discuss with council maybe different ways we could um, get people to become more compliant to go ahead and get their sticker in the city. Um, I know I talked to Commander Keck about um, what he, his thoughts were, and he said that, you know, you don't want to lower it too much because you don't want, you know, everybody running all over the place. But the, the actual cost of golf carts and, you know, to make the golf cart compliant to our uh, code is very expensive and so I think that takes care of that part. I know myself I have a golf cart it's an older golf cart it's fully insured and it's in my carport because every time I go to bring it down here to register it something else goes wrong so I'm working on it but um, I have other people in my neighborhood that have golf carts and I said why you know why haven't you guys gone and got the tag and they're like it's way too much money, you know, um, just for us to be able to ride up to the store or go to the library or whatever. We, it's a lot of money. So I'm looking to discuss with the council on maybe lowering the initial fee is $150. Um, maybe lowering that and keeping the annual fee at $50. And what your thoughts were, and maybe we could promote it as you know, this is a way to cut down your carbon footprint, um, an alternative transportation um, for the city. It's fun and it's there's no um, carbon footprint or whatever you want to say. Um, and gas prices are never going to go down. So, um, you know, it's an alternative. But I was just wanted to discuss with the council what your thoughts are on how we could promote this maybe better or get more people to be compliant with, um, you know, our code for golf carts. I just have a quick question. Um, you say your, our fees are higher than most surrounding cities. Have you spoke to those cities? I mean, like, what are the prices? Uh, what surrounding cities are you talking about? And like, what are their prices? Where do we compare? Our, to ours the other is high. Our initial $150 is high. Satellite Beach is like. $45 a year and $75 to register. Um, Cocoa Beach is a little higher. Holly Hills, which is, you know, inland from us, their fee is $40 flat out um, a year. Um, yes. 
So, you know, again, I don't want to make it too low, but if, if we could get more people to be compliant and get them off the sidewalks by maybe giving in a, giving a break for um, registering. Uh, it's just an idea. Um, I'm hoping that I can get my golf cart down here to get it registered. I, and you know, like you talk about the cost, I just had to put new batteries in the golf cart and they're $800. So it's not an inexpensive thing. It's, you know, it takes money. So, um, and I think that kind of curtails everybody and their brother having a golf cart because it's expensive. Yeah, do you know how many golf carts they have versus us? Like how many Cocoa Beach has registered or any, I mean, do you know the comparables? Um, in Satellite Beach, they have a lot of registrations. I don't know the exact amount, but they, um, you know, they have a lot of, and I think their annual um, income is like $15,000 a year income from the registration. Um, and I don't know, maybe Brian could tell us how many people have registered here and, but, Commander Keck did say that they have not had, they've talked to people that are driving them, but they haven't given any tickets or anything. So maybe that's a way to get people to be compliant. But there hasn't been any real problems with the golf carts. Electric bikes, though, are on the other we, hand. We are having them on the beach the during spring break, on the sidewalk. Mm. The, on Ridgewood, it's a different story based on this month. This month. Golf carts? Oh, yes. They're everywhere. <laughs> are, but are they registered? That's the thing. Um, yeah. This One of the ones I saw parked on a public boardwalk access mm -hmm. that has no parking spaces, um, it was registered. It had a tag. Mm. You know, registered with the city, I don't know, but it had a state tag on it. Right. So, um, what I'm experiencing down on the beach side is that a lot of our short-term rental investors bought in the middle of the island. And when people come to stay for their vacation, they often want, they naturally want to be at the beach. When you're walking in the heat from the middle of the island to the beach boardwalk, that's a stretch. They dropped their prices nightly and weekly rates for a while, and then, bam, golf carts popped up everywhere. And you will see them parked as you go through the city in vacation rental, mm -hmm. short-term rental properties. So that gives them a way to use that um, as a, a, an amenity to assist to get guests to the beach without them, you know, having a heart attack in August or mm -hmm. September, walking down there carrying all their gear. So I think that we have two different types of golf cart users here because I, I know some people that are residents, full-time and part-time residents that use them, uh, but also we've had a real increase in the ones that are being provided through short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. Well, that's another thing I thought, maybe more education on where and how you're supposed to use a golf cart and um, more public um, service announcements or whatever. I know Zach did a, uh, a video and Kyle for golf carts, which was really good. But maybe we need more of that. Um, Maybe we need on the sign out front, register, register your golf cart with the city or, you know, I'm just looking for suggestions and what you guys think. How much is it, $150 to per an annual pass? Initial. Initial. Initial 150 and then the next year it's 50 Yes, it's 100 and, and so that 100 is not in the first year with the 150, or is it 150 and your first year? I need 150 the first year. And then when you go to renew, it's 100. 100, okay. 
and Commander Keck and the team, have they no issues so far out there just educating, knowing it's a new program, any citations? Yeah, no, that's what no. I asked. We, we haven't gotten a lot of calls. Um, we, we, I know we tried to do a search, but the problem is we need to do a traffic stop because it comes up with traffic stop. Unless you go through every one and then decipher what you want the traffic stop on. So mm -hmm. we might need to look at kind of doing a separate category and initiating a new, new call for golf cart. Um, but we get a call occasionally. Um, yeah, we haven't gotten any that I'm aware of on the beach. So I know if, you know, if, if people see that, please call us because obviously that's not allowed. Um, but in, in talking to, you know, a couple of ones that I've stopped that ended up being actual low-speed vehicles because, you know, initially a lot of times you can't tell until you get in behind it and then they have to act. Um, I know what we are having problems with sometimes because Cocoa Beach has um, some places that rent, rent golf cart, rent low-speed vehicles, uh, maybe mm -hmm. golf carts as well. And so one of them in particular, the, the license plate is North Carolina license plate. So it's registered, so it is a low-speed vehicle. And what happens is those are illegal in Cocoa Beach because it's 35 miles an hour on A1A. They get up into Canaveral here, and now all of a sudden it's not legal because we've got 40, 45 miles an hour. So we encounter that. That, that is, is one of our issues that we encounter. And so we try to educate because these are people, visitors, tourists here. They rent. And, and of course, the golf cart places, I don't know what they're telling them, the low-speed vehicle. Yes, you know, take this. You can go all over the place. Um, and then some of the people I've talked to have just said, it's just not really worth the bang for the buck for the golf cart because you're, you're very limited, you know, in the city of Canaveral. If you live on the west side, you can't come on the east side. If you're on the east side, you know, you can go down to the beach access or hit a couple of restaurants or a convenience store, but there's really no place else to go. You can't go into Cocoa Beach on a golf cart. You can't go into this port on a golf cart. So if you have your low-speed vehicles, you know, you can do that. And I know as we have those discussions, you know, we're talking about it. So, so that's, you know, that's kind of – and, I mean, I know we've got a – uh, like a, a vetting process, so to speak, right now with the registration and whatnot. And I know I, when we talked, when I talked to Councilor uh, Councilwoman Kellogg, that was just one of the things that I said. You know, it might be that we don't have a lot of the issues, is just because there is a process, and we want to make sure we have responsible golf cart, mm -hmm. you know, owners and and people that are doing this to make sure they're following the process. If you get rid of too much of the process, then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, you know, let me get that, and then we just. Now we got a lot of irresponsible people, you know. We can't can't stop all of them, but um, but that was one of the things that, that we talked about. So that's just that's just kind of some of the feedback and the input that we that we were seeing. So. Thank you. And would you or uh, Officer Palmer, I guess, could know roughly how many registrations we have? Ten. Ten. Yeah. Thank you. I've got them right here. Ten. Ten. Citywide. Ten. 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 Okay. Well, you got to start somewhere. So I think, uh, but that I think is your point, mm -hmm. right? Is that we know there's more than 10. And uh, I, I don't know what too low is, but even if it was for temporary, um, you know, if the city worked towards uh, uh, re reducing that, um, I think $100. Initially and then maybe yeah. 50 a year. I don't know. I just I would like to see more than ten people, because they are <coughs> out there. Um, you know, some of them are tagged through the state, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but golf carts, you know, I would like to see more than ten, and I would like to see them not on the sidewalk. Can I make a suggestion? So maybe we should have staff like poll beachside communities to see like the number of golf carts they have versus their fees, and and just do a comparison. To the local, I mean, that way we just have an idea where we where it's a better way to go. Yeah, I think it's going to take time and uh, lowering the fees, even for a short term period, uh, we can help, but it really will only help as much as making them aware. And yeah, I think it's always prudent to compare to the other cities, and so um, doing doing a little research there, and then trying to work with. The community, maybe it's just one event we plan out, and yeah. it's a, a golf cart type event, and says, "Hey, get here!" Also, everyone who signs up, you get your first registration or your first year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's at a discount until this well, date, right. this deadline, and if you don't sign up by that deadline, mm -hmm. that's a good idea. And that's what I was looking for ideas. Rates. Yeah, on marketing, maybe more uh, like an event, like you say, you know, 
like they have bicycle helmet thing. This could be a golf cart uh, event and you bring your golf cart or, you know, come find out about it. I, I, I just thought, you know, it's a shame it's only 10, but I, I just hate to see the ones out there that aren't, aren't licensed by the state and aren't tagged by us, you know, so that's all I got. I think it is a little high, I, I agree. Yeah. So thank you, Commander Keck. And um, what do we wanna do? Uh, maybe, I mean, I'm game. I think you just introduced a discussion item about we got some data, 10 has registered, how do we increase? Lower the cost can help and maybe uh, do that <coughs> after we get some do, um, some comparative data to communities and maybe we work towards promoting, you know, that golf carts are legal in Cape Canaveral, here's the cost at a, a lower rate. Mm -hmm. Come uh, get registered down at City Hall and we right. can help promote it. Yeah, yeah it sounds good. It's a lot, and um, you know, I just because that's what people are telling me. Well, that's too much money. You know, I've already spent ten thousand dollars on this golf cart. You know, mm -hmm. and for them to take it to the state, the, it's a pain. But it's only like thirty dollars a year for them to renew their tag through the state. Mm -hmm. But they have to. Um, it has. You know, it's a low speed vehicle. It's a little different, but. Um, they have to take it to Titusville to get it tagged, and that's a problem. So, and that was initially why I thought, you know, making us a golf cart friendly city would make it easier for people to use the alternative transportation. And, um, you know, small town feel, golf carts, you know. Um, but we have to be competitive with other prices and not make it too much money to but not make it too low either. So there has to be a happy medium mm -hmm. somewhere. That was just my idea. And I just wanted to hear from council what, what their thoughts were. So. I'd be fine lowering it, cutting it in half. Uh, you know, I don't, I think it's an issue of getting awareness out there mm -hmm. and mixed in with the folks who do know about it. 150 bucks isn't fun to shell out and then pay a hundred every year. Um, so thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, between now and April's meeting, maybe we can bring back something. <coughs> or okay. maybe work with the staff to get some kind of. So could we just look at, uh, what is it, uh, satellite? Oh gosh, Vieira, which, no, they they changed, oh, that was state law, the 14. Um, Vieira is not even a comparison with no, us no, because no. it's yeah. it's a golf cart. Yeah, I mean, Satellite Beach, Cocoa Beach, down Cocoa the, Beach, the line Melbourne mean, Beach, to, mm -hmm. to a handful of them just to get a barrier island ballpark. And, and then, if I, if I understand, the consensus is for staff to reach out to available resources that are out there doing this for total um, registration initial cost, renewal cost, and total number of registrations for Brevard County municipalities and maybe a little wider and then bring that back as a discussion item at the April council meeting. Yeah, sounds I good. I think that'd be good. Move the ball forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me give you one of those real quick because we can just pull it up on the web. On satellite's website, there's, theirs is 150 initially for registration and then $50 um, thereafter each year. Satellite. So similar, exact same, uh, uh, year one cost. And then fifty dollars yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Exactly. Yeah, th that is exactly what I was had in mind. Um okay, well good. Discussion item. City manager, you're clear on the consensus? Yes, sir. Thank Sounds you. like we already got some of the data rolling in. And that would I think if Mayor Pro Tellum uh Kellum concludes item number seven. Thank you. Okay, and so we are now uh, through item for action. Uh, item number eight, I did mention these are informational, excuse me. Uh, we moved uh, item number nine as a discussion item, so I guess nine is now the, follows this one, the new number eight. So, um, 
This is an update to the January 24th, 2024 special council meeting. And our city uh, on January 24th, obviously we had met to discuss uh, the issues related to community development code enforcement uh, building department and discuss some improvements. City staff put together an information item. Um, and so when I had the opportunity to go through and review this information, um, and, and the city manager had a chance to go through with me, it, I did not want to get through this meeting without addressing some things that I see that I think we could look at improving. Um, and so thank you all for, for moving it. This item really came from, while we mentioned Fillmore Avenue and Jackson Avenue, this is just to, to back up here since the beginning related around some of the biggest issues I think we deal with here in the city around code enforcement in the building department. And it's happened and it seems that the next issue is resolving these issues uh, takes much longer uh, than, than I think we all hope for. And so for me, this is, as at the end of the February meeting, I think I said, yeah, I put this up here with A1A safety as a top item. Um, because I think there are life safety issues related to this. We've heard the comments um, from Ms. Schaller. We've heard the story of the hearse. I've received information along the way. And overall, I guess the first question I have and want to understand is when I go through this report and, and read the status update, 300, so I'm on the summary page, thank you, perfect. So items one, two, three, four, and five for the Fillmore Avenue, and one through five for the, for the Jackson Avenue properties. Out of the 10 total, I think two of them delivered our, our submitted as as complete so item number one uh obtain and disclosure of the city council attachment two provided is basically saying hey this one's done out of the five that's my first question is are we saying that item one is completed in its attachment two um, uh, and item one was obtain and distribute to the city council a building permit inspections report showing date type of inspection and disposition and in the case of failed inspection cited codes in any inspector notes this report applies to all codes applicable to all permitted construction performed at 304, 306, 314 and 316 Fillmore Avenue include building official statement that all necessary inspections were ultimately approved. I guess, can we walk through, uh, well, at a high level, I think attachment two, when I, when I go to it, which is the first one, I, we are looking at a, uh, this printout is from BSNA. Um, city manager, is that correct? Dave, would you address this, please? So, thank you, Dave. Or, and so, I guess, is this a report that was produced from BSNA? Can you, can you produce this report at any time? And if so, what's this report called? Or what could we call it, just for the sake of reference? Is this a, a general overview or a, a full printout of the, the uh, address? Uh, or the permit, really. It was just specific to the permit for that property. Yeah, that was in response. This is responsive to item one. 
Mm -hmm. Those are on the inspections report. Mm -hmm. The SUVs, these are all from the inspection report. Those are the ones that they, they had in their possession. Um, contractors, the licensing, um, there's some some things that the contractor has in there to help help them with the permit. Show what the permit looks like. When the inspection occurred. Comments, um, and um, yes, and so I think your other question, Mayor, was can these be produced at any time? The answer is yes. This is a queried report out of BSNA that can be run for any address at any time with any specific time frame. So uh, thank you. So obtain and distribute to the City Council building permit inspections report showing date type of inspection and disposition in the case of failed inspection, cited codes, and any inspector notes. Uh, this replies to all codes applicable to all permitting constructed and include building official statement that all necessary inspections were ultimately improved. Is that provided? No, there's no building official statement. I don't okay. think Mike would be willing to pr provide that statement until this whole issue is resolved. Okay, so the so item number one is the status update is not completed yet. Yeah, if it's, your, it's lacking the building official statement, which I would imagine wouldn't. I, I can't speak for the building official, and I'm not going to, nor do I want to. But uh, well, I think if that's I were a good the building, point. If I were the building official, I would not be making any um, statements like that until this project is completed. Well, the certificate of occupancy was issued. Correct. But I think since then, since statement. then, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Since it was issued, there's been things come to light. Okay. So item number one is not complete. And really, uh, I think we have attachment two, but item number two in, in obtainer engineering report, we have the proposal attached for that. But Correct. that work is, that proposal is being administered now, or that agreement. It is, and we have received a draft of the engineering report uh, that came in uh, uh, this, just this last Friday, so just a couple of business days ago. Um, we've gone through it and um, still have some questions uh, on some of the statements made in the, in the engineering report. Um, I believe we have a conference call within the next few days with Kimberly Horn to clarify some of these issues. Uh, they, were, they were unable to make some definitive conclusions based on the lack of information. Uh, so we're going to try to coordinate gathering that information with the project engineer, which was Allen Engineering. Um, so until some of this information that is lacking is, is gathered and provided to Kimley Horn, we'll, uh, we're, we're going to be waiting for them to finalize their engineering report. But we do have a draft. The proposal from Kimley Horn did not speak of any deadline or anything. No. We heard at the January 24th meeting, it was reiterated in February, the importance of these two issues. In your eyes, when do you think we can get this finished? Well, Kimberly Horn is really good about turning around, um, turning around the report. So I would think as soon as we get them that information, uh, they should be able to wrap it up. And I don't know, Lexi, do you want to pop up here as well? Um, so Lexi's very involved with Kimberly Horn. Thank you, Lexi. Um, I would, I would hope we could have this wrapped up by the April Council meeting. Um, just to add to, and this is, this is my bad for not including or not peeing Dave, and I actually was able to speak with the engineer um, who did the report, the draft report this afternoon and asked a few clarifying questions. So we'll um, get some of that stuff in writing for him to add to the report itself and, and get it moved around. The one thing I do want to just kind of stress to remember is that this is still an active site. Uh, so there are still changes being made. So although Kim Lee Horn is doing an assessment, there is still earth being moved in regards to the physical characteristics of the drainage. So as much as we can get a report turned around quickly, 
if the site is still in flux, we will not be able to have an accurate representation of what the final product will be when we get that report. So that's just kind of, there's, we have a, two parallel processes happening and that was at the request, at the request of council in January is that we had Kim Lee Horn go out and begin this process sooner rather than later. Thank you. The purpose and the scope of the report is intended to ensure that the original design as revised meets or exceeds all applicable city codes related to site development, including but not limited to on-site stormwater drainage system and its connection to the municipal stormwater drainage system. So and they are assessing both the proposed design as well and all of the um, supplementary material that comes with that, that proposal, that site plan, as well as the existing site conditions. So the, the part that they cannot necessarily have a complete comment on or a complete um, engineering judgment on, will be that'll be entirely dependent on when that site is completed for some of like the FP, like the pole being moved and then some of the conduit and stuff like that. So un until that is kind of settled, the site is always gonna, it's not quite gonna be where it needs to be because it just won't be returned to the state it's meant to be in until that pole is removed. Yeah. If I mean, that makes sense. It's just, it's, it's um, I'll call it like a mildly active construction site because it's not a, a big operation, but it is still an actively, um, an active construction site. So the, the site conditions won't be able to be restored and then assessed by Kim Lee Horn until that pole is out of there. So to date, the status is FPL has buried their lines. Spectrum has come and removed their attachments. The pole is still installed. I saw it today or yesterday, I to, think. It's to our knowledge, Spectrum still has to underground two. They, they've, they've undergrounded their wires for two units in one structure. They still have to underground the two units for the other structure. So Spectrum is still doing work. Okay. So the pole has to remain until Spectrum is completed with undergrounding their utility. Do we have any indication on when Spectrum is going to finish their work in IEFPL, which is really item number three? No. Okay. Item number three, item number four, and item five are all I, awaiting to be presented. Uh, number five, the city manager and city attorney. And, um, and then when we go to Jackson Avenue, item number one, a, a response to this item was split into two documents. I went through and saw it and I didn't see anything from BSNA it looks to me like a word document was for, or field notes, but, and I know that it said generated by city's BSNA or any other record storage, but I guess really out of the 10, none of them are f completed in full since January 24th. Is that right? They're all in the works. If, can you respond to that? Well, we can go down each one of them if you'd like. I don't that would, want to that do that. Would be I think we should just know this off the top of our head. I mean, yeah, I, it's not. Yeah, the, the, uh, as far as Fillmore Avenue goes, I mean, we, we're, we've inserted ourselves into an active construction site. And so it's difficult to start take. We've asked Kimley Horn to go in and take a snapshot picture during the active, in the middle of an active construction site. And things are moving before it and things continue to move after it. And so um, uh, only until Florida Power gets those, gets those poles removed, gets the pole removed and everything's underground and the developer is able to come back in and um, uh, address the contours, this drainage swale, at that point, a as-built can be put together. And at that point, Kimley Horn can take a look to see if the actually what's in the field, 
and that's shown through an as-built, um, how that compares to city code. So it's, it's, we're not going to get any resolution on the Fillmore Avenue project until FPNL gets their project done and every, those dominoes can start falling at that point. I hope that makes sense. Um, so yes, 304, the, the, the Fillmore Avenue ones, we, we will not see any resolution on those items until, until FPNL finishes it, finishes up their work. Com, or uh, excuse me, Spectrum comes in and finishes their work and then the developer can come in and, 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 and address the drainage swales. And then the engineer can ad adjust based on all that? Correct. Then, then Kimley Horn can determine, yes, this, this swale does meet city code. Or they can say, no, it doesn't meet city code, and these are the things that have to happen to, to address any deficiencies or, or inadequacies. So that's when those dominoes will start falling. I hope that makes sense. And we do uh, not have any indication on FPL or Spectrum. I know it's well, overstated. But F FPNL is done. Um, they're done with their undergrounding. They're en they've energized their lines. We're all good there. Only until Spectrum gets those lines off that pole can FPNL come in and finish their portion of the job, which is removing the pole. I think that's finished. The spec if I Spectrum's only only wired two of the four houses. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So as soon as Spectrum comes in and finishes the other unit, then Florida Power can remove the pole. Who's responsible for communicating with Spectrum? I have communicated closely with FPNL. I've asked FPNL to communicate with Comcast because they do have communication amongst themselves coordinating these efforts. Um, so, um, and I know Florida Power and Spectrum have been communicating, but who's responsible for saying, hey Spectrum, you're gonna be out there this day and you're gonna get it done by this day? Um, I I'll give, them a, give them a call tomorrow. Sure. Let's, let's let them know that our presence is felt by them too. I'd be happy to call them tomorrow. Thank you. But who's re who should call them? The F I appreciate F that, but who's, who's responsible? If this is under construction, FPL has a responsibility to install their lines compliant with the code. Yeah, At the last meeting, it was no, it's the, it was the developers responsible. We sort of got tangled up there and so today, I think the issue is, is that pause of who is responsible. And I'm not saying you are. Is My understanding there is when it's an initial spectrum service, the developer has to call for it, schedule it, pay for it. Once it's an existing service to come off a pole, it's an FPL pole. That pole is owned by FPL, installed by FPL. Now FPL wants that pole back. So FPL would contact them to remove it. Just like when AT&T and Spectrum is coming off these poles on A1A. FPNL's got their lines up high on the new poles and they cut the other pole and leave it short and they're wanting AT&T and, and Spectrum to get off of there so they coordinate with them to get them off of those poles and get on the big one so we can take the other poles out. That would follow suit here that FPL's coordinating with Spectrum to get them off of the pole that they want to remove here too. And that pole is a code violation. It's Correct. a violation of the design. The so it's a physical violation when it's we pull our yes. code and we look yeah. and we go, that's not the, supposed to well, happen, right? The, Who's that on? The, the technical violation, not to split hairs here, it says underground service has to be provided. It doesn't say anything about poles. Under, okay, because underground service was not provided there, there was an issue with our, our code. And that's why they installed the pole. And that's, that, that pole gave them a place to hang overhead lines, which created the violation. And who, who made that decision, I guess? Is, is who, that FPL's decision? We don't know who makes that decision, but we do know that it's the developer's responsibility to make sure the violation does not exist. And today is that, I guess this is the problem because it's, the property sold, 
and I, I you know, Dave is sitting sort of in the middle of this and seeing um, some issues we're, tr we're trying to address, but my hope is this would be a lot further along today. I didn't want to get into the March meeting and basically have zero out of 10 complete. And this is, an, this is when we talk about workshops with P and Z, I'd rather come back and talk about this. This is so much bigger than Fillmore Avenue and Jackson Avenue. This is an issue that I think we largely learn from. Some of these things, and we will always do, created ourselves. And today, the property owners are not really any better off. And when I went through in detail and read what is provided here, I don't know about the rest of the council, but I did not learn a whole lot more. And I'm patient, but the patience on this being a couple of years and going back several years with uh, Jackson Avenue is sort of at the point where we need to know who's responsible. And if, if it is the developer, or are we talking to them today? Or the, or the, um, the contractor? Because I don't see why they're gonna get in a hurry to get it done. Where's the, what, why would they, what's the pressure today, we today don't, to get it resolved? We don't have any evidence to say that the developer is not willing to work swiftly once the poll is gone. Everybody's waiting for the poll to be gone. Do, do we have, I believe the engineer, uh, Adrian. Um, Adrian Molinari, that's p &L engineer. Is he still the engineer assigned for it? Or? He, as far as I know, he's involved in the project, yes. And Spectrum, we have a, 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 we don't have it. We're working through FPL with that. Um, can we get the representatives from FPL, Spectrum, Allen Engineering, Mike German, ABC Construction? Okay, uh, Kimley Horn and Associates, our code enforcement and any other people all in the same room. Because I'm trying to communicate through here and it's always somebody else waiting on them, awaiting on them. And I get it. I wanna talk to them. And I wanna hear why they struggle. In the middle of a project, I get. But this is the gas pedal down. And so I did not express a deadline in January 24th to get it done. But today, I'd like to ask the council, I wanted to propose a deadline. And this is far more important than so many items we're working on. And I think it's important to the community. It's caused a lot of pain. It's caused a lot of money. It's caused a lot of tears and heartache. And it's just really not getting resolved. And so, is it lack of resources? What, are they not listening to us? Are they not respecting the city of Cape Canaveral? I think this whole council can sit in front and to talk to them, but I haven't spoke to these folks. Uh, John Picard, I can provide the list of the people. Three engineers are involved. John Picard, Allen Engineering, KHA. Two utilities, Spectrum, FPL. Building official. Um, ABC Concrete. ABC Concrete. Concrete. And to my knowledge, this ABC Concrete, I, I mean, just to give you an example, I went in to see, and if I'm wrong, I'll be the first one, and did a search on ABC Concrete, <coughs> and I don't see they have a business tax receipt with the city of Cape Canaveral. They don't have to have it if their business is not centered in the city of Cape Canaveral. They're okay, so you don't need to, to build houses in Cape Canaveral. They're, they're, your state license. That's gives, only for headquartered businesses. Your, when, if you have your, if ABC Concrete has their headquarters, 
in Merritt Island. They need a business tax receipt in Merritt Island, and they're allowed to contract throughout the state. So we do not require a business tax receipt for non-headquartered domiciled businesses, businesses now. Right. Okay. okay. In this report, and from my correspondence with the property owners and city staff and following the email chains, I think the, the, the property owner received some updates in between the last meeting and now. I think that it was going to be weekly updates, but I don't think that happened. That's but happening every week. I'm sending Miranda in, uh, an email and, and Miranda and Sherry. It's been 55 days. Mm -hmm. We've had eight weeks, if my math is correct. Mm -hmm. You're telling me you've sent eight updates. Yes, once a week. I'll provide those to the council. If you're being told if you're being told something else, then I can verify my side of the story. I think a good idea would be to just send it to the whole council so we don't have to wonder. I'd be happy to do that. I'll copy you. I'll copy the council on my weekly updates. That's a great idea. I certainly don't want bad information circling around about the veracity of my stories. So I'd be happy to do that. This Wednesday, we're meeting at 6 p.m. It is my recommendation that we come back together and it's all hands on deck to get this resolved. Can I verify? Please, a I'm things. finished. I'm um, okay, so we're stuck at this point where Spectrum's cable is on the pole that FBO owns and you can't get Spectrum out to take the cable down, correct? Okay. And I'm going to tell you this is a common story with telecom vendors. Um, I would like to suggest to council if city manager is okay with it, if you are okay with it, Mr. Dickey, that I make a couple of calls to contacts that I have with Spectrum to see if I can get this expedited to get this cable removed. The other option is to, for the contractor or someone else, to hire a contractor to go up and take the cable off the pole. They can put it on the ground and call Spectrum and say, FPL's pole is gone, your cable's on the ground, we've been waiting for this for quite some time. I would be more than happy to assist with getting this done. Facility issues with cable and telecom vendors can be one of the most frustrating things you've ever dealt with in your entire life. But this needs to be expedited, and unfortunately, this truly is something that the general contractor should be doing, and we're stuck in between on all of this. And to do this, you know, I would need everyone's okay, go ahead and give them a call because it's not acceptable and sometimes you have to push these things along. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm more than happy to help make a couple of calls with contacts that I have at Spectrum and, and talk to someone in facilities and say, we just need a cable off the pole, that's it. It's your cable, FPL's pole, when can I get this scheduled? I think that, I mean, our city staff is doing that to, to an extent and it's not getting resolved. And I've seen some of the emails that you've sent that where we'll get to it basically. And on the 29th, it was supposed to be done and then it wasn't getting done. I think there are no bad ideas but does FPL know, does, does Spectrum know that the, the council gave a 5-0 vote to get this resolved? Yes, I've spoken to Michelle Mural about that with FPL. And, I, and I was also on a conference call with Michelle, with Adrian, and with Adrian's boss, the lead, lead engineer on this, in this part of Florida. Explained all of this to them. We were given, frankly, lip service that we would, this was probably three weeks ago, a month ago, here we are today. I think 
you have the right to investigate, to question anything, and to figure out what's going on over there. That's but I think I'm direction from the council to, to is would be solved. If you'd like to speak, you can come forward, Karen. But we do need you to speak. That's what I thought. Then that's okay. just a matter so of FPLs bringing the pole down. On the so record was the comment was made that there are no cables on the pole. So w did we misunderstood? Why did we not know that? Um, I'm, who's indicating there's poles? Who indicated that? Okay. Um, I've been in, let's say, two or three... Uh, I've been in very close com conversations with um, the two property owners out there. I was notified the day two of them came down, and I was notified that same day by one of the other property owners that two of them were, were still um, overhead. And I asked them as soon as one of those, as soon as that changed, to let me know. Um, and I followed up with them every week on where we are with this. And if you hear anything or see anything that I need to know, let me know. Dave, are there more than two main entry facilities onto the property? Meaning, a lot of times what they will do is they'll bring in cable on this side of the property to mm -hmm. accommodate these two units, mm -hmm. and then again on this side of the property to accommodate those two units. Is it all combined in one entrance to the with the facilities, or are they separated out? because we could have a pole with no cable on it if there's another entrance facility that has cable on it. So these are things that we need to know to be able to get this rectified. Yeah, my, underst my understanding is, is that the cable is running on that overhead line that's coming from the northwest portion of the property over to that pole, and then it drops down from, from, that, from the pole. So it's, it's coming in from one location. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. could I please um, work with the owners or access the property to observe and take a look at those facilities? I, uh, I don't have the authority to, to grant you anything more than you have the authority to me. Okay. And I think you uh, reaching out to the citizens, and uh, I think that would be good. They've made themselves available, and just... The, the latest updates that I've received is discouragement. And I don't, I do not know if I failed to communicate how important this was to, to this community. When I look at the big lens out, if we could fix this, we're gonna fix a lot of problems in one. And we've really struggled for good, bad, and wrong reasons. And I don't see in this report the update that really understood the intent. I mean, it was about compliance, and I know it's under construction, but I think that there's a communication, too, where the, the telephone game that happens, and there's nothing on the Jackson Avenue side that I saw that I think it... It's a mess. I think we're. I think we're, we've added data. Some of it's valuable, but I really want to say, I the only thing I know to do is to come back together and to meet and to bring some of these parties in because it 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 is not it is not getting I think the traction that that I that I had hoped for and the reasons is it's in somebody else's hands. Um, I don't know what else to do other than to, to get everybody in the room because the stuff I hear and see about what's going on and what I've read is I think that there's been some con confusion on the intent. It was about compliance, about going back through the work. It was about a, a not necessarily a building inspector. We talked about our city attorney reviewing the tariff and reviewing and to see if we had any leverage in that meeting. We talked about uh, the issues at Jackson Avenue at the end about going back further uh, than, than the, the time period as we heard 
tonight and then some of the statements that I'm reading. You know, it talks about being in chronological order. It doesn't look like it's in chronological order. Um, it, it, it jumps around. It talks about in the reports that um, things don't exist prior to 20. Uh, two, I guess when we go to the page that was mentioned by uh, Ms. Schaller on attachment four, and I know we're jumping around, but the following report includes a chrono chr chronology of Cape Canaveral code activity. So um, it's the next page, right there. Mayor, point of order, we are at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Um, Need an extension, please, and I do recommend uh, at least 15, 20 minutes if we're done in five, great. I would like a meeting, uh, please, uh, so that we can figure this out together. But a motion to extend. Make a motion to extend 15 minutes. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Willis, second by Council Member David, or uh, Ke Mail Pro Tim Kellum, excuse me. Uh, to extend 10 minutes. C City Clerk. Councilmember Davis? Four. Councilmember Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tim Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Councilmember Willis? Four. This is what I have at this end there. So there's, yeah. The, the statement at the top five, uh, it's the next backup, one more page. The page prior to that, please. The following report right there at the very top, it includes a chronology of Cape Canaveral code enforcement activity related to these addresses, uh, February 11th and February 7th. Records prior to February 11th, 2022 are not available. I don't understand that. When What does Sorry. that mean, I guess? Is that saying? Sorry about that. My mic was turned off. The, um, <clears throat> when you go back to the little uh, thing that we did here, Mayor, um, if you look at number one where it says provide a report showing all actions and correspondence related to code enforcement at, and it gives the addresses. I don't need to go through it. Um, this, the, the field notes is the most accurate report that we have. Um, the correspondence we also placed in the um, in, a, in a folder all the email correspondence that we had. Prior to this, we don't have any um, field notes on this uh, property uh, because they just they at that point in time they weren't done. We go back to the older um, code enforcement that was done on it. The notices of violation that are in the system, and I believe that was also put in a folder. Um, I did provide that. It was um, those notices of violation. Um, you, however, those, the older notices of violation that date um, back to, I, I can't remember the date, Ms. Schaller said the date, um, the older ones prior to all of this. Um, back then, that's what we had to work with. We had notices of violation. We had scribbles on pieces of paper. We had stuff to that effect. That was, uh, a lot of that happened before my time. A lot of that happened before BSNA came around. Um, if we were in an old system, an I IMS system, where you didn't put notes in, you didn't input stuff like that. It had dates and then you could, I, I believe I barely worked with the IMS system, I apologize, but I believe you could save documents to it. Um, Todd could probably speak better on that. Um, so literally the only correspondence and stuff that we have back then would be the actual notices of violation or if I could, if our system had, or if it was saved in our system back then, you know, we could have the, um, the complaint form, um, that, that the officer filled out. I didn't see any in our system. Thank you. I Brian, where are those records that we do have?
from January 1, 2016 through the date that this report began. The notices of violation that were issued back then are in Laserfish. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did take the majority, or all the ones I found, I took and put in the, in the folder, did we? I the, thought they were. I thought they were provided. Also, um, if they're not in there, I can, I can send them to all the council members. This, what was provided was um, going back to February 11th of 2022. Yes, that's the field notes. Okay. What else Why was provided just, besides like, that? Where's the BSNA? That this is the field notes are out of BSNA. That's what we use in BSNA. We, we create field notes in there to say what we've done on what date, when our inspections were done, stuff to that effect. If you print up a, if you print up a BSNA, it's not gonna give you the, like for instance, what you said here, what was here was report showing all actions and correspondence. This is what shows the actions. If I printed up something out of BSNA, it wouldn't show you any actions. It wouldn't but how give can you anything. we go in the building official BSNA report and it shows actions all up and down. It shows that in building inspection, I think BSNA is a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, we spent a lot of money on it and I know we're trying to work through to get it. Mm -hmm. But my hope was after this meeting, we were clear that BSNA would generate a report. That, that, those field notes is a Word document. Yes. That, yeah. that just a blank word document, no header, no formality. This is our professional work product mm -hmm. that we're bringing forth to say, here's what we did. And it doesn't make sense. And I take a lot of issue when I read through some of those field notes and the specifics that's being stated on the details that I go, why is this relevant to a case? Um, as we heard uh, today with, with Ms. Schaller and I don't know how we can say it. We've offered more money. We've offered more resources. We're running with two full-time. We have two code enforcement officers. We don't have a third. We have a third in training, from my understanding, which is great. But we're running two with that intense short-term rental market. One of the biggest, Cape Canaveral and Cocoa Beach make up 80% of the short-term rentals and that's our code enforcement that we've delegated. I know our team is busy, but where I take issue is, why aren't we saying we need to invest in this now? And I do get frustrated when we're talking about uh, repairing something else or working on dams and stuff. That stuff's exciting. That's the stuff I wanna work with, but behind me, I've got texts, I got emails, I got issues, and they're not getting resolved. And so, my hopes were high at the end of that meeting that we would come back February. We didn't do anything that at the end of the meeting I expressed, but I was sort of hoping to have something by then. What took so long going back to Fillmore to get the engineer to go walk the site? The 27th? So this was done on the 25th. Why did it take a month to go do the, to get the proposal? I mean, that's, if my math is correct, that sh and now we're waiting on the engineer. The whole month of January came and went, well, at the end of January, the whole month of February pretty much came and went, if I understand, before we were able to go out. And so that's an example of, well, of course, the, well, now we, we just got the draft report, but did, is there a reason why that took so long, I guess, to start? There was um, a draft and a revision. There were a couple meetings to get the revisions correct, to get the report, to get the study. Yeah, the scope. The scope correct, so that for them to understand it. Okay. And they understand it today? Oh yeah, they, well it's included here. And they, de and they delivered it, and, it, and it's missing information? So, Todd, if you don't mind, if I could clarify. So that time period from the workshop to when the engineer also uh, was, was on site also included providing all of the documentation from the initial proposal for new construction to the engineer 
as well as redefining and tweaking and making sure that the scope was correct. So they were doing review prior to visiting the site as well. So that's not just when that's not just when the clock started, so to speak. It also involved um, the task order and, test two. and getting that and getting that all situated as well. So it, it didn't just start when the engineer showed up on site. There was back matter done to it as well. That's good. So so there. They, this project initiated with the engineers sooner than that Correct. earlier? Yeah, no, the site Do visit, an there would never be, a, a site visit is just that, a site visit. There is, there is a decent amount of front matter to, to, that goes, that happens prior to a site visit. Okay. I, I communicate with the property owners as I think I should as an elected official on all we do. And my first test is, are they happy? And they're not. Does it mean, just because they're not happy, does it mean that we're doing something wrong? But it's just my, it's my indicator. That's a good start when they are. They're more frustrated. We're doing something wrong. And I wanna help. And I wanna support. And this council, I think, has been very gracious in supporting. It's sickening how much money and time we put into this. And honestly, I do have reluctance approving other things in the budget because this, this is what is not, I think, budgeted. And if it is, it to me seems really simple. And I keep hearing about involvement with the developer and Gary. Why are we still talking to them? Why are we not talking? I'm about not talking to him. Have you ever? Oh, okay. I, I, don't, I don't believe I said I've been talking to Gary. I, no, I didn't say that. Okay. I, I, who have you spoke to? I've on, been talking on, to on ABC the Concrete. Contra you've, you've the qualifier. ABC? Have you? I, I met with you yes. and ABC. Yeah, the next day after the meeting, I think, mm -hmm. or the day after. And now, is, have you seen him since then or met him? Um, I've not met with him since then. Have you ever seen him at the site? No. Have you ever been aware that he's ever went to the site, the, the contractor? The contractor? No. Did we verify his license and upload it to DSNA? I never um, saw it. He is a licensed he, contractor. We would have done that when they pulled the initial permit. Mayor, did we extend it to 10 I didn't know, but 10, that 15? was not in DSNA. His, his, his. There was no Florida license DDPR in there that I could see. Okay. Let's, why don't, Mayor, it's going to be, I'm not sure if it's super productive for us to be just, uh, I mean, I would love to meet with you individually and we can sit down in front of BSNA and we can answer a lot of these questions. I can't answer these questions for you this evening. I um, want to talk I, to people who can. Pardon? I want to talk to people who can. I do it's too. Always the engineer, the contractor. I'm not aware the contractor ever go into this site. I've never seen the site. I take that right home. I'm not seeing the realities of what's happening on Jackson Avenue lining up on the paper. Mm -hmm. This has to be fixed. I am over it. I'm tired of being on the wrong side of this issue with my team. We're on the same team. 110%. This is me versus you. But Great. what I'm saying is this team is going to fix this. And I'm saying, Todd, this ultimately falls on you. I want to support you. Anthony, I hope that you can come in and you have full authority as counsel to city attorney. Tap in to this more than you are and say, guys, I, I think I can help. The, the billing, the invoicing, the support, whatever. I don't need criticism on how useful our time is. I'm this not criticizing you, Mayor. The highest and best use of time. I don't care if we sit in a room for five hours and do, and, and as long as it results in this getting fixed, I'm on board with that. 110%. And there's a lot I can say about this. I didn't talk to Todd about the, Todd gave me an overview, I learned you know, I read, I was hopeful, and I know we can get it done, but for some reason, what seems to be simple 
is not getting done, and we got a lot of manpower. That January 24th meeting, we had a lot of the entire building department, community development department, a combined hourly wage that's handsome. Mm -hmm. This is expensive on the taxpayers to do this. And I'm standing in front of taxpayers, and this is what they want me to do. They this is want what I, this, this resolved. And I, and I can't, when he talked about Council Member Jackson interacting, absolutely, but we really shouldn't have to be doing that. And so my hope is that we are not in April saying this is resolved. I can meet April 3rd. I can meet April 10th. I can meet other dates, but we do not get into the April meeting and, and it's another update. I will stand in front and say whatever needs to be said to any of the contractors, but having them all in the room would help. I think this entire count, you could ask some of those questions directly. And if they don't want to come to the meeting, that's fine. If we got to remove and replace next Wednesday, fine. The third, the seventh, the 27th, whatever the dates are, I will make myself ava available to support you. But I'm not seeing the direction that was given done with urgency. There was no deadline for the engineer to get it done. The engineer's waiting. We, I know we have talented team to figure this out. But the work product is less than desirable. Not impressed. And I hope my work product's been bad. My hope is that this is taken more seriously. And if I failed to communicate it as mayor, I'm here to have another meeting and state it again. And so please know that every time your phone rings, mine rings too. And when, they, when you tell citizens that you're going to do something and it doesn't happen, that stinks. I'm not saying you did. I've done that. I've told citizens, I'm going to get that done. I'm going to take, I'm going to, I'm going to go figure out what's going on. We, we're going to, and I continually let them down because it's a chain of, and you guys continually are let down by other contractors. I don't know what else to do. Mr. Mayor, I'd like it's to late. make a motion to extend for 15 minutes, please. I'm finished, but yes, if that's what we want to do and if there's any citizens that want to <coughs> speak, so. Uh, yep, motion by Council Member Jackson. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second to extend for 15 minutes. Any issue? City Clerk? Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tim Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? <clears throat> Four. Council Member Willis? Four. I want to fix it. I've said enough. And we have Peg here tonight. We have uh, the, the Wittens here, Karen and Ron, excuse me, and they're, they're, uh, Jim and Miranda Hurst just uh, got back home to, to New Hampshire tonight, and the whole period here, they left out today, and whatever we need to do to get this done, I would say in the next 10 days. It is, it's just the best number I can come because it's been going on for years. And I want to support city staff, but we can't be the council that the citizens want us to be when we are bogged down with these issues that are not getting resolved. Agreed, and I don't want to be the staff that's creating these issues for the council. And so I, I hope the council understands that certainly not my wish for us to have these continued conversations and everybody being frustrated. That's the last thing I want to have happen. So obviously there's something missing from our equation. We're not seeing something here. I think it's that simple. So what is it that we're not seeing? What piece are we missing to solve this problem? I have an opinion on that. It's not my staff, it's not the council, it's not the property owners, um, but um, we'll meet with the city manager and the city attorney and see what ability we have to force action on those players that 
we um, appears we don't have a lot of control over because I think that's the weak link in this process. But that's my opinion. Council, comments? Thank you all for listening. I'm willing to participate in any meeting with anybody anytime. And if, if Todd's okay with it and Anthony's okay with it, I'd be happy to put all of them in the same room and we can have a knockdown drag out. Whoever comes out wins. That would be great. I just don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we'll be able to get all the players in the same room. But I am willing to try my hardest to do that. With, uh, I can put a list of those in an email to the city manager. If the city manager could send an email to them, a phone call, certified mail, whatever, with a date, and if they can't make it, they can't make it. We're flexible in Cape Canaveral. They can attend virtually. Hopefully, we can get that working. Phone call. They don't need to stay, but their participation is welcomed and needed. I hope we don't have to have that meeting at all. But I'm trying to get in front of the April council meeting and we're back here with a little bit more information opposed to resolving it because I want to get on the good side of this where we start implementing the things that clearly identify what were the problems? Why did this happen? What are the solutions to fix these problems? So this is the same thing with the Jackson Avenue property too. Why, why did it happen? Why is it taking so long? Why, you know, Peg brought up a lot of points today. Um, you know, that it needs to be resolved because it just continues and continues, like you said. And, and that's my argument too. We talk about CIP and new projects that are coming along. We have to fix these things. And like Peg said, co-enforcement is a major that's needed and I'm glad that we're budgeting for another code enforcement officer um, I think that would help um, but I, I agree that it's, it's gone on way too long so whatever we can do meeting or whatever uh, I'm sure council is ready and mr. mayor I'm gonna plan on going out there this week and taking a look at the facilities I want to see how it's coming in I'm familiar with that, mm -hmm. and that way I can get an idea of where we might have an issue with the physical facilities, so. Any input that can be provided, um, and if the engineers did not go back and were instructed to listen to the meeting, that's an idea. Because when they read the, the narrow down approved outcome i think having the conversation around it i went back and listened again and that's where i got frustrated because we were really expressing with clarity and and when i see that it came out some of it i agree it's not our fault but we are not gonna i think sit back on this and just accept and not verify these things so can I, can I ask a, 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 I guess I'll ask it a favor, is this, this report that we provided that the council is, is, is looking at this evening came from the minutes from the January 24th meeting. And the minutes were prepared by Mia, of course. Mia does an excellent job at, I'm sorry, the city clerk's office put the minutes together. And my, my wish is that if, if the minutes in this, this table doesn't reflect the council's wishes, then I don't want to be going in the wrong direction. I don't want to be spinning my wheels on trying to accomplish things that the council, that wasn't the intent. That's not what you want. That's, I, I don't want to do that. So I'm not saying we have to do it this evening. Maybe we do. I don't know. But I, I would like to know what specifically the council, if it's not in these minutes, if it's not what the council wants, then I, it would be helpful for me to know 
where the shortfalls are in these minutes and what, if, if we're going in the wrong direction, where, what direction do we need to be going in? Well, are they updated? Because number three, we talked about the fact that the cable isn't on the pole. We were, first we said it is, now then we said it isn't. The, this says it is. So mm -hmm. we have to do this, in my opinion, which is my opinion, but I think that if we took this as in a direction of using it like a, with a project plan, mm -hmm. where you put out those tasks that need to be done and what date they're needing to be done and mark off the ones that are completed, where it's literally on a timeline, a Gantt chart, whatever we need, so that you can easily visibly see that that step's been completed then you know what, it's gonna help. Um, because, you know, on this one, clearly they're saying, they're saying, excuse me, that the wire's not there, so, but the pole is. So, but this one's saying, they stated they're waiting um, for Spectrum to remove it. So we've got some things happening maybe in the background with vendors that maybe we're not getting updated on, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm updating this table literally every day. I met with three of my staff today and updated this table. So I don't want the council to feel like this, this is not being looked at on a daily basis because it is. Oh, no, and um, I'm, not in, I'm not insinuating that. I'm saying with this, and I'm still going to say it, this is a project. It mm -hmm. needs a project plan, mm -hmm. okay? Whereas this is good information, we just heard that the cable's not there anymore. It's hard without milestones to check it off, tick it off that it's been done. And so there's a lot of stuff going into the weeds possibly and not being followed up on. And not, this isn't, and I get it, that this may not be something that is normally done we're doing this because it went so off the rails. Um, but regardless, we as a city need to know, this has been done, tick. This one's done, check. Check that one, check that one. Spectrum's taking it off the pole. Okay, now we're waiting for FPL to get the, and where the notes are good and helpful for me, mm -hmm. it's harder to keep up with updating or things of that nature. So um, that's a suggestion, just a suggestion with me. I'm gonna, like I said, I'll go out and take a look at the facilities and I appreciate your info, info on what's out there, whether it's coming in from both sides or one one drop, um, because it, it it's not fun. Working with these types of vendors are not fun. And I will say this as well, if they say they're coming out, I mean, let them come out because they're horrible to get back out. And it's hard to get their things through their engineering. So, but all of this should have been done and we're gonna have to take hold of it at this point and guide this process or else it's not gonna get finished. It doesn't look like we've got anyone that's at the reins for it. So I'm willing to help in any way that I can. And I'll go out there, Dave, and take a look. And I will talk to, if Spectrum's still on the poll, I'll talk to Spectrum. If, I, if they're not, I'll talk to FPL. I have, I have contacts from my businesses in both, of the, in both those companies that can point me in directions that may end up with results, I can't guarantee that, but I'm willing to try. I just want to respect the process uh, when, with that. City manager and his and the team here who we have, that we're not interfering okay. with anything. And so, you know, you asking questions is one thing, but, you know, giving direction and things like that, you you want to really work through our, our city I'm manager sorry. for stuff like okay, that. Okay, so which do um, I not do? I'll go I, out and look it, at the pub. If you want to, you know, meet with the citizens and ask questions and consult with our city attorney about it. But I just, 
don't want to go down a path where they're getting orders, you know, or, or no, or I comments understand. Or, okay. And so, uh, but uh, the plans are online too. I okay. think the electrical showing primary service coming in, and I, I think. Uh, the more people who can understand this, the better. I think too many people talking to the same entity could cause more problems. Um, but to learn and to help expedite, I, I think I've offered that to, to our city manager and for the most part, I, I mean, he communicated and then it sort of fizzles uh, with what, you know, FPL is not getting back to us and then the city manager will follow up and Dave, and then it fizzles and it's like tick tock, the days go by, the problem still exists, and it really wasn't that complicated at face value. I mean, when we saw, and and I think we don't have a problem in figuring out what the problem is. It's, we have a challenge, engineers are held up because of this wild, wild west. We have no authority or leverage over the utility companies, uh, but you know, it's the contractor's responsibility or, you know, it's, and anyways, that, that, that is it. And as far as the, you know, the code enforcement side, the BSNA, you know, being able to create these reports from BSNA is really in, in, important. And, and Mayor, you're saying it's from. <clears throat> Mayor, I can create the exact same report that you got from the building official. I can create that report. Okay. It shows dates. And that's pretty much all it's going to tell you. When when you ask for the um, when you ask for the the information and the correspondence, mm -hmm. when I looked at it, that had more information, the field notes. But if you'd rather have the other, I'll be more than happy to create that for you. I also just wanted to, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kellum, that that property is going back to the magistrate in April. Um, due to non-compliance and him not bringing the property into compliance and we'll be the the city will be uh, suggesting liens on that property at that time so I just wanted to update you on that because you you know you were wondering how where it was so okay. and we're, we're talking about Jackson they had <coughs> yes, until March, Jackson they had until March 8th to complete certain things and they pull, didn't pull, pull building permits for certain activities and they haven't done that so we'll be bringing them back to the special manager. and that lien will be we'll ask for it to be retroactive back to march 8th that magistrate meeting is it the date scheduled yet yes it's in april roughly when i believe it's april 26 but i can get you that date so if he had any intentions on pulling permits he would have done that by now he had to do it by march 8th he did not pull any permits by march 8th so we're a month out from that magistrate hearing to prepare. Okay. I'm 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 sorry. It's uh, April twenty third. April twenty third. Okay. We don't have one this this month. We don't have a magistrate mm -hmm. hearing this month. Yeah, I think that's a good example of expediting. I mean, it. carry on, I guess, with, with that and do what's best, but. Mayor, can I say a few words? Please, I, I've yes, been sir. listening very patiently to, to everything that's going on here tonight, and I wanted to make sure I heard from everybody, and I think I have. The Fillmore Avenue is a very difficult one for us because things did not go properly. So we're dealing with an odd bird trying to fix this, and then we made an extraordinary solution proposal at the January 24th meeting, which we have been incrementally working towards. And yes, there have been steps towards resolution. We can't say there's been 0% progress. Is it as fast as you want? No, sir, it is not. Is it as fast as I want? No, sir, it is not. As you expressed your frustration, you also expressed dealing with entities that we have no control over their schedule is frustrating our attempts to control the, the delivery date of this. We all want to control a delivery date and just have it done because so much of what we're used to doing, we have control over. We're, we're butting heads with another entity's processes and we have no control over them. 
yes, we're trying to influence and exert our, our will and our influence to the greatest extent that we can. And maybe having a, a come to Jesus meeting in front of the council with all the parties, maybe, maybe that could help. Let's, I say let's, let's talk about that. There was not a deadline put in, and I know you admitted that already. The, you suggested 10 days from day we, today we have Fillmore completely done. I would love to have that done, but can we promise that? No, we can't promise anything. We can't promise that ABC Concrete is going to go out there with a permit and do this work even though we've paved a path to do this. We'd be foolish to commit to that time frame. All we can do is our very best effort. We believe we have a great plan in place. We believe we've got capable people. We know exactly what needs to be done. We're all willing to pitch in. Thank you, Mrs. Jackson, for willing to pitch in. I think you brought some valuable insight. You have to know certain people sometimes to get something extraordinary done outside of the city. I say, yes, let's take your help with that. Let's verify if those poles are free of lines. Let's, if they are, let's find out when is FPL going to remove that pole. Let's get that out of there. Then let's contact that contractor. Are you going to be willing to commit to this? If this is done by this date, can you get out there? We'll have that permit issued for you the next thing in the morning. Maybe this can happen within 10 days. This team sees this vision and knows exactly what needs to be done to complete Fillmore as soon as possible. Beyond that, we also see a lot of process fixes that are necessary to update the code in our forms and applications to match those updates and codes so we don't have this problem repeat in some other area in some other way. This is a very big thing that we take very seriously and we've committed a lot of time and effort to and we're going to continue to with that passion and that enthusiasm to do everything we can to the best of our abilities. We ask that the council work with us, continue to have the consensus among council to get this done as fast as possible, but also I'm asking for the faith from council that we are. And that's all I have to say, Mayor. Thank you. I, I know what we do have control over. I'm not guarantee asking that something be done in 10 days, but to bring forth an effort that you're really proud of and you can communicate it and say, we did this and we failed. And then I would, I think that's acceptable, but we have control over. And the, the issues here to me are not as complicated until it's the so many different people and people retiring in the loss, but it's all a byproduct and a symptom of not documenting, not keeping good records, not um, having the reporting system. The way we get information is email me, call me, come by and talk to me. And I see us transitioning into it's in the SNA. If it's not in there, it didn't happen. It's on this report. I'd like to see the Word documents eventually get away. And any citizen at any point can go on and see scheduled. Maybe one day we are tasking and saying, I don't need to talk to Dave. I can see his, he, he, he tried five times this week, login task that syncs up with emails. There's all types of things. I don't want to have to be like that. But on this one, I'm going tunnel vision because it's my, in seven years, this represents the biggest opportunity for us to, to to fix some serious life safety issues in the community that I've neglected, unfortunately, citizen inbound calls and requests for things that are really the fun stuff and things that I enjoy and I can't do it today. I cannot because I study this and I read it and I go, I, I don't understand how we're here. And so I'm hopeful, but I don't, no guarantee in 10 days, but I think no matter what, we can check in in 10 days and hope that, that we've seen progress of some sort. I'm not saying it wasn't 0% done. I see more data formalizing the, the, the written uh, agreement is progress. I see those things, but... Uh, Full court press at this point, and I think 
we've got all the resources we need to get it done. And there's nothing, in my opinion, more important than than getting to the bottom of this and resolving and coming with real solutions. Um, again, this was at the end of the meeting. I thought about moving it up and requesting that the council move it up to the earlier part of the meeting. And I didn't because out of the respect of, you know, those other issues and there was people in the room, but this has taken up a lot of time for the people in here tonight. And it continues. After we all go home, we all make our own calls and individuals and we all might collaborate. We talk, and it just keeps exponentially going. And so I am hopeful that this gets better, but it, it is coming off the heels of, I think, we're past that point of patience here. And so read, the, read to understand the council, read the words that I think the city staff wrote and we vote, voted on and supported. It doesn't do what it's, what it's saying that you're, you're providing. It, it's not accurate. There's there's errors. There's sloppiness. There's not a professional work product that I think for this at a minimum you can get a little rough on all the other. This one can we polish up? I mean, can we really make this the the test case to say, here's anything you want to know on Jackson Avenue, anything you want to know on Fillmore Avenue. Here's the status. Go online, and we're going to work to bring the resources in for this is how the city of Cape Canaveral operates moving forward. We invested a lot of money in that. No metrics, no deadlines. And so today is about a deadline. And I think we have to set one in order. My expectation is no more than 10 days. We have uh, something back. If the draft engineer report came today, the next one's coming, uh, whatever's next between now and then. Um, the city attorney, if, if his availability, I think is crucial for this, if needed. Uh, but that's what, it. I'm sorry, what is the deliverable within 10 days? Uh, I would like to revise uh, an update to, I mean, stay on the track, right? I mean, I think you're plugging through the 10 items and I'm saying I don't see any of them that I think are complete. That's because they're not. And so this, this is a very messy process. We're learning a lot of, I would call, weaknesses in our processes. And we're trying to ferret them out and fix them. And it's going to be sloppy and it's going to be messy. And um, I think though, and this is not going to happen in 10 days. It's not going to happen in a month or two months. Remedying all of these issues that we're ferreting out is probably gonna take the better part of a year to figure out and address all of our processes. These are gonna take a lot of ordinance changes, changing applications, maybe even changing our comp plan. There's a lot of things that need to be addressed. So I don't want, I want to tamp down any expectations that this is gonna be a quick, quick process. It's not. Um, this, the fix, the final fix is going to take a while. Um, but we are, we are committed to it. Um, we're going to try to bring these two items to a, a quick conclusion, but the long-term fixes may take a little bit of time. Dave, I'm talking about the short-term fix. Yes. The 10 days, what is the deliverable? What is the council consensus on that deliverable within 10 days? I don't know either. There's 10 action items listed. Five for ja uh, Fillmore, five for Jackson. When you watch the video, the meeting, when you read through those, are those requests being fulfilled to their fullest? I don't want to hear, well, you didn't give us a deadline. It it's, should be as important as possible. We don't need ASAP. And so I am communicating for the first time what I thought. I thought this meeting was the meeting to come. And when I saw it as informational only, I thought to myself, great, it might be, that's all it needs to be. But this needed discussion. And so my, my if we need to come back through and re-communicate the issues, great. If we go down the list, 
of the the events i would say starting with one all the way through read through them and and ask uh yourself are we answering these questions to to the intent Mayor, we I, want, ultimately I, we want this resolved for the property owners agree completely i don't want to try to be interpreting the intent of the council that puts me in a very tenuous position I felt this was a pretty good report on those specific items that were identified by the council in the minutes, which this council approved. So it's, I honestly, I, I need more direction. I need more clarification. Okay. If this is okay. not what you wanted, I, I, I don't want to be wasting the council's time nor staff's time. Okay, let's do this. Let's next week make a request to meet with all the contractors that we listed. I'll email a list. Let's have that meeting. Between now and then, whoever can come can come. We'll try to do it at a time that's available. Let's go through this list together, all right. of us in the same room, and try to resolve it. And that's the best I, that's the best I can offer. It's late. Um, the The... The report, I mean, by our own admission, these are not finished, mm -hmm. such as the official statement. Well, you're saying you can't speak for Mike German. I want to talk to Ms. our building official, right? We can get everybody in the room. He can answer for that. So is that clear? I think we whoever. We can set the meeting. Did, we can re request a meeting with all the parties, with the people that you identify in the email. Yes, we will do that. Yes, and go through uh, these items and, 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 and let's resolve them. Uh, it, the, the engineering report, I think the draft is out, working through the natural process with staff now. Um, that was just the beginning of that. That was a stormwater carve out. I know the back and the front, it's all interrelated, but getting them in the room and Mr. Picard, is he available? I can't, we can't force people to come here. We don't subpoena people or anything. But can Mr. Picard come to a we meeting? Can, we can certainly invite him, yes, have, sir. Have we reached out to Mr. Picard since the January 24th meeting? Oh, not since January 24th. That's a head scratcher for me. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's a pretty important person. The last two letters in there. And it was from Mr. Picard, and now has Kimley Horn reached out to him? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I doubt it. I don't think that was in their scope was to talk to the uh, past city engineer. Was the quality and inspection for Fillmore Avenue up to the standard that we like? I don't think we can answer that question yet. In your opinion, from the, t okay, a certificate of occupancy was issued. Mm -hmm. Does that say? You've passed inspection in, in a in June? Yes. Do you think that the quality of inspection was there hindsight? No, I don't. I think that's that was one of the issues that we've identified that we need to, that was one of the things that I mentioned yes. we need to root out and address on where we fell down and how to fix that. And that's, those are, that's one of the items, and I agree. I think the CO was issued prematurely and it wasn't properly those people who should have been looking at that to give the building official the, the comfort level to sign off on the CO, that didn't happen. And why didn't it happen? So we're trying to, we're trying, we are addressing those issues. And I know that the, the you know, to, to address it long term, that does take time. But for this project to nail down and to say, here's what we found, here's how we're going to fix it. We don't have clarity on who we're applying leverage to. I think we first this was a civil issue. I mean, this is two to three years, and now it's it's complex, and this isn't easy. It's the same story. It's the same story with Jackson Avenue. The same complaints that came in. The building is in compliance. Er, compliance was in the field. The same fire existed the day the inspections or the, was out, and suddenly now there's problems. That's the stuff that makes my head explode to go. Wait a minute, nothing changed. There was a complaint made. They said compliance was in the field. Then they go out and suddenly they see the same things that the original complaint had mentioned. 
I don't like that. That's not right. And I want, and I believe we want to fix it. We went, we had a three or four hour meeting going through this. I think you are clear and you interpreted some of the things in the last meeting on what we're trying to do. This issue is licensed contractor is who we should have been talking to the whole mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. To date, I'm not aware that we have since the meeting other than the next day meeting that we had. But the property owners haven't seen Mr. Baez at the or, or the, the GC there, there. There would there would probably be no reason for them to see Mr. Baez at this point because the contractor is waiting for FPNL and and um, Spectrum to finish their duties. Then the contractor will move in and do their business. But I was told that the contractor is responsible for making sure that FPL does this. Okay. Yes. So shouldn't he be there to make sure FPL fulfills the job that a CO was issued on, that the inspections weren't poor? Can we go back through this and properly inspect it again? That was the gist of it. Have the building inspector go back through it again and say, try again. Let's see what you catch this time, because the property owner is telling me issues. I, I'm not aware of any there being any Florida building code with the actual units themselves. Any issues? I'm not. I'm just saying, go back through the full inspection, the process, when the report that was thing, I and think to ask yourself, did we cover all the bases? That's, I believe that's what because we're doing. Because the whole time we were not dealing with the contractor. Before. Correct. I think so we've we've we admitted that that's dead on arrival. We've that's, admitted to that, and I think that's exactly what we're doing this time. So the contractor coming off the heels of the June, here's an example, the January 24th meeting that I didn't think I would need to explain, is after we met, I was thrilled to know that we met, ABC in the city is has got to, to stay hip to hip there and to, to follow up with that contractor. Mm -hmm. And from my understanding, you haven't been following up with the contractor. I hear that the other entities, the people that got us in trouble in the first place, were, they're still trying to deal with us. I'm not dealing with Gary Wittenkind. Neither am I. I'm not sure where you're hearing that from. Has Mr. Wittenkind reached out to the city to try and resolve this issue, Gary? He has written a couple emails. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but we're we're not taking the initiative to work with him. We're working with the contractor. Okay. Where do I see that we've worked with the contractor? And what progress has been made other than the meeting where he said understood and, and, and I basically affirmed this. Is the contractor, does he feel the debt that, that I feel and this council feels that this needs to get resolved? To me, what leverage does the city really have over him in the first place? The leverage is that the work was done. Uh, COs were issued incorrectly. But the work was done and the property is not in compliance, which creates this conundrum of the city approved it and it was not in compliance. We can make the argument that we could revoke all of the COs. We have the ability to do that. Now, none of us want to do that because we got people living there. That's the, that's the leverage that we have over the contractor. Revoking the COs equates to, you don't have an active building permit and you've got work that was done incomplete without a building permit, which equates to you did work without a permit, which is a violation. Contractor must do work with a permit. That violation could then be reported to DBPR as a contractor complaint. That's how the leverage would work, will work with this contractor. We could, we could pull this trigger, we could, we don't want to, but if you force us to, we may have to. If the CEO is told with the property ownership to occupy the building, is there a condition? We would find a way to provide a conditional or temporary CEO for this period of time. To be determined, though? Right. But you know what at, at this stage, um, and I did speak to the manager briefly about this, I mean, 
the man the manager has a point um, that is a very um, extreme measure to take at this stage at this stage of the process with four townhouses that have been CO'd and occupied for well over a year now I believe uh, we also discussed you know, at the end of the day is to try to get the property restored into an, in a perm in a in, in accordance with the city code and, and making sure that um, Kimberly Horn certifies that it's built in accordance with the, with the city code. Um, that, that objective, uh, the manager and I also talked about um, a dedicated um, easement granted to the city for emergency purposes for ensuring that the stormwater system is maintained um, in accordance with the plans approved by the city. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, once once that pole is removed, this is my understanding from talking to staff, then that opens up the door to actually restore the property to permitted conditions in compliance with the city code. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that's the the main objective, right? I think uh, I think the city can can get there, various ways and possibly approaches to that, but. City can get there, but the, what the manager's talking about is pretty would be pretty extreme. I, I don't know the consequences to the actual owners that are actually occupying that building. The city were to go down the route of revoking the CO, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. I would think that talking with the property owners would be a good idea, obviously, prior. Something like that would be considered. Their circumstance, I know they're not so, uh, and that, but that's one of uh, the few property owners. Um, the city does have a an emergency stormwater management easement. That's swale system on that property has ingress, egress rights, and the ability to restore it if necessary. Is there anything in this? agreement that we can put more pressure to support Dave in, in, in getting uh, that pole out of the ground. Uh, yes, I know that, I mean, we choose a franchise agreement to work with them too. Um, Not so sure, Mayor, I think if I need you some information regarding, you know, Florida law um, and the city's ability to require undergrounding of utilities and power, power companies, uh, are regulated by uh, Public Service Commission. Now, with that said, when the city did negotiate its last franchise agreement, there is a memorandum of understanding uh, between the city and, and FPL that expresses the city's um, preferences and strong desire regarding you know, not only undergrounding the utilities in the city, but also the removal of uh, unused utility poles. And um, but that was an issue at the time, as I recall. There were a lot of wooden poles that were sticking out of the ground with no no lines. So there is a little clause in that memorandum of understanding. And I had suggested to the to the manager, I may have suggested it to the council. You know, FPL has a government relations person. That their primary responsibility is to, you know, make local governments uh, happy and listen to local government concerns. So. Um, with that memorandum of um, agreement, I, I would, give, especially given this meeting, um, get on the phone tomorrow morning with that government relations person with FPL, and if, if those lines have been removed, um, I would uh, stick that memorandum of under uh, memorandum of agreement under their nose and say this poll needs to be removed, um, and, and hopefully that lights a fire under them. The suggestion that <coughs> that that seems like a lot's riding on that pole being removed. Yes. Everything, yes. all the dominoes will, I think, yes. fall very quickly once that once that pole goes. And so that's what I see. In my understanding, there's just a pole. The, the wires, from my understanding, have been removed. And so when I think ten days, I don't think that's unreasonable. Can the pole be removed in tomorrow, the next day, by the end of the week? And then can we get with our engineers and, and 
and to bring this to to a, a close. Um, tired. I know we're all tired. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public before we close? I'm finished. Shala, Yvonne, Karen, any comments? I know that you had raised your <coughs> hands a few times. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you, Zach. Lisa, thank you for hanging in with us. With that, I look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. We've got a motion by Council Member Willis, second by Council Member Davis to adjourn. City Clerk. Council Member Davis. Four. Council Member Jackson. Four. Mayor Pro Tim Kellum. Four. Mayor Morrison. Four. Council Member Willis. Four. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.